Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to the Water Damage Boot Camp. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Kristen. I'm the event specialist here within the Circle. This webinar um, will cover topics such as uh, source of loss versus cause of loss, categorization of water, dry standards and drying goals, equipment placement and calculations, and so, so much more. Um, this webinar is eligible for four IICRC continuing education credits. So without further ado, the reason you are all here, I will pass it over to Chris and Ken. Beautiful. Well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending where you are. A um, couple things. We're going to do polls. If you haven't been to one of these, when we do polls, it's completely anonymous so that anything that you answer in there, uh, no one's going to see your, your information, your answer. So you can be truthful. Uh, we ask some sometimes difficult questions and uh, and just answer them truthful and and we'll have a discussion kind of crafts what Ken and I do uh, through this. We have a, a a framework of how we'll present this, but then we usually make sure that we we talk to some of the points that you guys are experiencing. The other thing here is this flow, but what we did is we followed through hydro, and so if you're trying to figure out uh, whether you're going to implement hydro in your business or you have hydro and you're trying to figure out what some of the stuff is as we work through here this is the workflow that hydro has and then this is a little bit of the learning that goes around that so it's it's supplementing what you're doing with the tool and then it gets a, a lot deeper uh than that with uh, the discussion that we'll have with ken so uh we're going to go through we're going to source a loss cause a loss uh categorization of water we're going to talk about drying chambers uh, psychrometrics and vapor pressure differentials, how it impacts materials, so the material uh, permeability, and then drying standards and drying goals. And then we'll get into a little bit of a moisture mapping discussion. I, I saw a bunch of questions in the uh, in the registrations about that, uh, creating conditions for stabilization and drying and why you're stabilizing. There were a lot of questions about stabilization, Ken, that was coming in uh, on registration. Uh, equipment calculations, we go through that piece and explain how it can help uh, and hurt your business. Uh, placing equipment, reading dehumidifiers, there's inspecting to completing, and then we also have a little bit of some of the constant uh, battles that happen uh, in the review process. You'll get some arguments, and then we have some rebuttals and some discussion points around that um, coming from the, the, uh, the standard and otherwise. First poll, we're going to start with four polls, get a bunch of polls out of the way. And this is more so about who you are and what problems you're dealing with. Um, what part of the restoration industry do you work in? And it could be part of the insurance industry. We've got restoration contractor, insurance carrier, TPA, subtrade. We put in an other category this year. Uh, you might be coming in as a consultant or something that's on the side. Uh, it might be a homeowner. We've had a few of them register. Um, right now, it looks like we got mostly restoration contractors, some insurance carriers or uh, adjusters, and uh, no TPAs this year, and no subtrades so far. I'm excited to see we have some insurance uh, company interest. This is a this is excellent. Yeah, yeah. We'll give it a few more seconds. It's uh, rallying in, and uh, looks like a a ton of restores. One sub trade, couple sub trades, one TPA, and three or four carriers. Perfect. And then we got a bunch of other, and, and I have no idea what your other is. <laughs> but that's okay. Kristen, if you want to close that, we, we, we've got our audience. Um, that's awesome, guys. Well, welcome. And if you're not on a restoration contractor side, welcome uh, welcome into this. It's uh, We're glad you're here for this discussion. All right, the next, uh, the next part we have is what percentage of your jobs are reviewed where price and scope are challenged? Um, and this is could be in the TPA environment. If you're not in a TPA environment, it may change a little bit. Um, Ken, I don't know if you, like while these guys are answering, this has been a change in the last 20 years that you've seen is, is the review process. I know you talk a lot about it, but uh, but this is something where we're seeing right now the numbers are coming in. Zero to twenty-five percent is uh, it's actually it's almost almost split down. Zero to twenty-five, a third of people aren't being reviewed or very little. Uh, twenty-five to fifty is twenty-five percent. Fifty is seventy-five percent of the time is twenty-five percent, and seventy-five to one hundred percent of the time is uh, is seventeen percent. And it looks like it's sort of holding those numbers. 
What I find interesting here is that, uh, I, first of all, I, I think it's important everybody understands that this is a very geographic phenomenon. Uh, here where I am in Florida, as you can see from my background, and no, I'm not really on a beach because I wouldn't be wearing a shirt like this. I'd be wearing my <laughs> bikini, just so everybody knows. But um, no, actually, I, uh, I, I what I'm really surprised about is that here in Florida, it's really common practice that the majority, if not almost all of the contractors claims are challenged after the work is done. It's a very Floridian practice. But if you go to other places in the country, um, uh, other states, it's amazing how many contractors have their files uh, challenged. Um, you know, only a, a few times, uh, like maybe a couple of times out of 10. And it's, uh, it's not very common. So I think geographically, uh, the the practice of file review, aggressive file review, scrubbing the file, uh, these types of expressions to try and uh, manage the uh, loss severity. This has been uh, something that is is become regionally focused in different pockets around uh, America. Uh, I know we have uh, a lot of uh, people from other countries here, Australia and Canada, which is awesome. And those practices might not be as common as they are here in America. For what it's worth, California, Texas, and Florida, those are the worst states for file reviews. That's what I have found. Yeah, it's interesting. And so we got the poll finished up with 31%, uh, 0 0.25, 26%. So it's, it's like you know, substantial review across the board. Um, the majority of them is is 25 to 100. We got 75% of the people there. Very cool. Yep. Our next poll we got going on is what percentage of your jobs are reviewed where quality of restoration is there? Now, this is different than a, a, a review on, on your price. Is someone coming back and reviewing your job and saying, hey, you, you follow the standard or you didn't follow the standard? So zero to 25, 25 to 50, 50 to 75, or 75 to 100. And again, the quality is, is these are would be considered like a two-way review where it's like, hey, we, we noticed you did the standard. You followed a bunch of the, the, the literature there. You were following a bunch of processes. That makes uh, sense. Hey, we noticed you didn't follow this. We should go back and fix it. And zero to 25 is leading 67%. Um, it's really, no, this is interesting. So Ken does a bunch of legal work and he does a bunch of file review or, or site inspections. Uh, I do a lot of legal review and I do a lot of dispute resolution. And in, I'm gonna say all of my cases and, and I'll, I'll, I'll maybe preference it with maybe there's one that wasn't, um, none of them received a technical, a competent technical re co-review. Uh, and so I haven't seen that yet, but uh, um yeah, try challenging labor rates, the do amount outside pricing. A bunch of this stuff is 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 on the quality. Did you did you dry the building? Are they reinspecting it? So it looks like the majority, 66% said no or zero to 25. Uh 25 to 50 is 17%. So we're assuming the majority is is limited review on quality of restoration. And and I saw one of the comments is yeah, they only care about price. And, and it's easy, actually it's interesting because price is one of those things that you can easily review, whereas quality requires a skill set that is hard to uh, uh, achieve. Can you go anything question, to add to that? This question, Chris, I, I kind of got a scratch on my head. How many of the people that read this question uh, are thinking that when a, a the file is being reviewed for quality, that the equipment use duration or quantity is not a reflection of quality it's a reflect reflection of practice because uh, i think that the drying strategy that would have x number of pieces of equipment for extended time is that a quality a challenge on the quality of the drying or is that where you when you formed this question were we talking about something other than equipment counts and duration no, it was it was it was quality. You know, are you are you are are you doing a proper uh, decontamination of the environment? Is someone checking to see if uh, category two is properly handled? It's it's in those sense. So, um, right. the numbers I think were similar to the last year. And finally, we got one last poll. Thanks for participating, guys. You guys, 
got a huge participation amount uh, coming in. I re really appreciate that. All right, our next poll is how much more difficult is it to make money these days compared to years past? And your mm -hmm. answers are, I haven't been in business long enough to know. Uh, it seems easier and our books show it. It's been getting more difficult. It's hit and miss. Uh, the longer I'm in the business, the harder it gets. And we're struggling to be profitable or not profitable. Again, no one can see your answers, so it, you're free to answer it. Um, and again, appreciate your your honesty. Yeah, and we're starting to get in that a lot of new people uh, haven't been in business long enough to know that that's a predominant answer. It's been getting more difficult. It's hit and miss. And and that seems to be the trend that we've seen over the last three years of doing this uh, uh, this session is, is that number is up. Uh, last year, I think it was 30%. This year, it's sitting at 43%. The longer I'm in the business, the harder it gets is, is trending right around 18%. And we're struggling to be profitable or not profitable. I tend to believe those are more full service uh, restorers, um, but it's 6% that are there. And, and that can be true. And we've seen uh, even uh, very good mitigation companies sort of get left in behind the pricing trends. And so we'll do that. Perfect. So it seems, Chris, that the, you know it's been getting more difficult. And the longer I'm in business, the harder it gets. If we combine those two, 60% yeah. of the attendees here are having challenges being profitable. Yeah, 66% if you take this, we're struggling in there. So it's a two thirds. And just to give you an idea, we did a, an estimating boot camp about a month and a half ago. And we did the profitability uh, boot camp or masterclass back in January, February of this year. Just for context to this, that number is about the same number as it was uh, for those other ones. So, so you guys aren't alone. Um, it a lot of people are finding it more more difficult to to survive today. All right, here's where we get started. Thanks for your answers. The symptom is focusing on the price. Uh, the solution is focusing on the quality, and this is something that Ken and I both have done in our reviews. We start looking at how do we how do carriers and contractors work within the industry. And one of the symptoms that you'll see is focusing on price. It's the easiest thing to focus on because it's the one metric that you can have an opinion on without anyone checking it. And it's a discussion. It's, it's a battle of opinions. Uh, in Canada, there's a lot of changes that have taken place. Several cases uh, that have gone to court have actually determined that if you're a preferred contractor of the insurance carrier, then the insurance carrier's actions are no different than the contractor's actions. They they tie the two together because the carrier is bringing a preferred in. Um, therefore, the solution in Canada is probably going to have to move to a quality solution because the courts have now tied the contractor and the re and the insurance company together and uh, and they're bound. Um, the solution that we start looking at is the legal processes in Australia. Australia, the, the insurance company is bound with the contractor. The U.S. There's still some some division there. And it depends on where you are, as Ken said. It's getting closer. I don't know if you got anything to add to that, Ken, on the percentage of files that you see go to a courtroom where where they're connected. I don't know if you're involved in that very often. Yeah, um, we're, we're seeing that out here in Florida, that it is um, getting more um, aggressive. The trend that I'm observing, though, uh, at least on the files that I'm involved in, is that you know there are depositions that are taken, there are files, there are experts files that are reviewed, experts that are asked to review those files, to go to the jobs and to explore the, the project, interview the policyholder. And they, the, the process, the legal process goes back and forth for the duration that typic is typical of a legal uh, lawsuit. It's usually at least a year and sometimes as much as two or three years before the court date. And then they take it right up to about two or three days before the court date, and then they settle. And it's a, it's a, it extends the, the whole dispute process for several years. And of course, lots of expense because of the lawyers and in, being involved, but it never actually makes it to the court. Now, there are some exceptions, of course, where it does go to court. And that's where the, you know, the experts have a, a, a field day, you know, going back and forth and the attorney's get more aggressive and vocal and it, they're, they're never much fun. But um, I find that they settle before it actually goes to court for whatever reason that is. Yeah, um, and I think 
The one thing I do want to say about your slide here really quickly, Chris, is I was thinking that the symptom is focusing on the price, the solution is focusing on the quality. What I have noticed is that the insurers typically seem to approach the contractor with the understanding or predisposition that all contractors deliver the same product. And I think that's the, the, the foundation of the error is that we are not all the same. And after reviewing many, many files, like I know you have, Chris, I've seen a grand difference in the quality of mitigation uh, performance among contractors in our industry. And so focusing on the quality is a legitimate focus. Um, and what I particularly am resistant to is when there is a quote, competitive quote after the work is done, that they found a competitor to produce a scope of work that is contrary to the original contractors. And they say, see, it could have been done for less. This is a really, if you ask me, I think it's a very poor practice because we don't all deliver the same product and we don't all have the same level of understanding and competence. It's not like we are all delivering the identical product. And I think that it it's really difficult for us as contractors to say that contractor over there is different from us because of, and then you fill in the blank, whatever it is on their quality control thing. But if you have a unique practice that you are particularly proud of, I would showcase it to say that this is your hamburger for the sake of discussion, that this is what your product looks like compared to what their product looks like. And of, I think that your level of education should also be showcased that while you might have 30 years experience, the person who prepared the competitive quote might be a, a new individual that is still learning the ropes of this uh, craft. And I think these are the um, elements that should be uh, mentioned to those who would rely on a less, uh, on a second quote from an unknown source. I think that's a good way of saying it. Uh, rather than the contractor that was on the job site and had to make go through the exercise of making the difficult decisions in how to make a competent mitigation strategy on that particular job with its specific needs. We're well, not all and, no, no, and, and I don't think you're wrong. So so when we talk about the legal process to that point, is if you were to come in and provide an estimate or a quote, the most amount of money you can make is that number that you wrote. So if it's a $5,000 estimate or a $5,000 invoice, that's the most you're gonna make on that job. And then to what Ken's saying is now you go into a review process and someone else writes a quote or you get a peer review from, from someone in the office saying that these prices are the wrong price. And there's a negotiation that takes place after you've done the job. Well, you're taking dollars off. So you're negotiating on something that the work's already done and now you only have money to lose there's not really money to gain in that process. And then you also have the other side, which is the workmanship side. If you have deficiencies or you need to go back and repair some stuff or you left stuff off the scope, um, you also lose money when you have to then do that extra handling and care. You'll see that a lot on the rebuild side, a little bit less on the, on the mitigation side, but you're still taking dollars off the job at this point. Now, everything after that contract is signed or, and that invoice is delivered, I consider this the legal process. It's a legal process of sorts. It's a, it's a collections process. It's a getting paid process. And then it moves into uh, the dispute process. So you get into an, a little bit further. You get past the initial reviewer. You might be inside of a senior management discussion that's taking place inside an insurance company, or it goes from a reviewer to an adjuster. And that costs you more money. That's time that you could be spent out working on your business that you're now navigating through this loss of dollars and it's reducing your profitability there. If you move to the part where Ken's talking about it, now you get into an appraisal position. You're paying a party to represent you. It gets really expensive. Uh, representation is, if you find someone new, they're probably $200 an hour, but it's like 200 to 500 an hour to find someone to represent you. And, and, and they have to be trained and qualified and a specialist to be able to make that argument for you. So you're finding somebody of a very high uh, uh, experience level and they're very niche in their skill set. You now are, are starting to spend money. What you're actually going to do is probably pay money out of pocket. You lost all your profit on that job. 
and now you're defending your your business reputation for the future. So you've decided that you're going to go into this dispute resolution to get the win because you're trying to send a message to the other side. No different than that's what they're doing to you. If this continues and it doesn't get resolved there, you're going to go to trial or you're going to go into court. As Ken said, this may you're in the process where you go through an appraisal or you decide to avoid appraisal and go straight to court. When you're moving towards that court decision or that, that court process, you're going to spend a lot of money getting there. You're going to lose a lot of dollars. Nobody wins in this situation. But what this is, is this is a battle that you're taking and you're putting it on someone's doorstep to send a heavy message or to change the precedent of a case. Uh, both parties will fight tooth and nail. It's hard to come out as a winner. At this point, everyone loses, but there's a there's a higher purpose or the reason you should be doing it is a higher purpose. If you think you're going to trial to win, to get paid, you're losing money along the way. There's no one that comes out of trial or that process that wins. Um, I'm going to say that, but now I'm going to say to Ken's point, there's some jurisdictions where it may pay if you are in the right to win, but it's it's a long process. It sucks a lot of energy out of your business. Ken, you you live in this in this world. Any any uh, objections to that? No, actually, I think you covered that really well, uh, Chris. I'm noticing some of the questions that are popping up in the the feed, and there, there's a one individual who is asking about these alerts, high temperature alerts, and and this sort. Um, is it? Do you have any comments yeah. about these alerts? Yeah, so so we'll get into that when we get into um, sending a drying plan. Ken and I talk about that in a bit. All I'll say is that the alerts inside the app are there to protect your technicians from making simple mistakes. At a high temperature, you set the temperature range inside in circles. It's an encircled question. Tell you what, let's get to it at question period and, and we'll continue on, but it's a good question. And I'll make sure if I don't cover it at the question period, let's cover it when we get to uh, drying chambers. And, and, and I'll explain how we use those, those temperature alerts in, uh, in hydro. That sounds great, uh, Chris. I look forward to that. So we also talk about claim documentation and drawing documentation. There's a little bit of a difference here when we when we look at this. The two types of documentation that you have, and it's because we serve a different party. If you only serve the customer, you would only be worried about drawing documentation. But because we have this relationship that's really close to the insurance company, uh, we get into the claims world. And we start to get into their nomenclature of using their terminology. And we also start catering to their needs, which is helping the customer uh, file their claim and substantiate their claim. So it's 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 not a bad thing. It's just you have to understand that they're completely separate. Um, insurance paying for water damage has nothing to do with how we do water damage. The payment of that contract, that contract could be written completely different than a normal uh, homeowner's policy that you see has no bearing on how you're going to restore the building in the sense of the steps you're going to take. So when we start to look at it from the perspective of doing this, it's about legal liability. From a drying perspective, how are you going to dry the building versus uh, what are we going to do for the documentation for the claim? And so we look at the insurance policy slightly different. An adjuster is looking at the policy to see, is the loss covered by the, by the insurance? And effectively what we're saying is, does that contract that the homeowner paid money to the insurance company and the insurance company then promised the, the homeowner they would be there for certain losses, is it covered? And if it is covered, how much is the insurance company responsible to pay? One of the, uh, one of the easiest ways to look at this is when you look at like a roof or a, a roof that has actual cash value. So if we take a roof that has 20 years life, at 10 years, it has a loss. The insurance company says it's at 50% of its life expectancy. We provide coverage for 50% of the roof and the other 50 you're on the hook for. If we were to look at water damage the same way, it'd be a lot easier. But in water damage, most of it is on replacement cost. So you get into this battle with the insurance company wants to reduce invoicing. It's, it also comes down to, is, the, is it covered? Uh, it has to be sudden and accidental, generally. Uh, generally, maintenance or poor maintenance isn't covered because you can control that. The insurance company can't. So they put exclusions in saying if it's a drip, uh, a, a, a leak over time, those are typically not covered. And as a water damage restorer, you would need to kind of have an idea of is there going to be who's going to be responsible for paying 
if you see a long-term problem, chances are it's the building uh, owner who's going to pay for that, not the insurance company. But there are some policies where that rule doesn't apply for certain situations. When we start to look at claims documentation, though, we're looking at the other side. Oh, I got a re um, extra animations here that I didn't want. Uh, they normally influence how your work. So when you look at the uh, customer, can they afford your services? Are you having that discussion? Are you talking to them about whether the uh, insurance company will only pay after certain things happen? What's the responsibility of the customer and do they have to take action in a hurricane or something along those lines? That becomes an issue and that becomes a little bit of a challenge to deal with here. Um, but we look at it from how are we serving the customer? So we look at it as two different industries with two different terminologies where we uh, where we serve them. Ken, what's it called? Is it called the, uh, is it the restoration triangle? You know what I'm talking about? The, the carrier, the restorer, and the homeowner? Sure. So would you like me to speak to that quickly? You may. Yeah, absolutely. Very quickly. So there are three entities. An insurance claim is an unusual business model because there are three entities involved in the transaction, of which there are two contracts in play. One is the policy between the insurer and the policyholder, and the other contract is in play between the policyholder and the contractor. But there is n rarely a written agreement between the insurer and the contractor, with the exception of Australia. They do have, the insurance company will engage a contractor directly. So um, in America, at least, it is a different um, experience in how to settle the claim. So your previous slide, Chris, was how much is does the uh, insurance company owe? Uh, how much should they pay the, you know, for the claim? And my uh, thought on that is it's unusual. It, it's disappointing that when a contractor completes their contractual uh, agreement with the policyholder and they submit the invoice, not an estimate, the, it, it's no longer an estimate when the, the scope of work reported in your file describes the services performed, not what you speculate will be performed, but were actually done. And so you submit the invoice and you say, here's the, the, uh, the amount that is owed. And then some third party, like the insurer, with which there is no contractual agreement with the contractor, steps up and says, I want to negotiate that final invoice. And we agree to it. And this is where it gets really complicated is because there was a commitment to the policyholder. There's an agreement between the policyholder and the insurer to indemnify. But the practice, as I'm seeing it, is that the insurer will negotiate with the contractor for a settlement amount as if it is a, a suggestion that the invoice and the scope was a suggestion when it's not a suggestion. It's a report of the services performed and the costs associated as, a, as stipulated in the contract between the contractor and the policyholder. And so to have it renegotiated after the work is done, I find to be difficult to accept. I'm trying to control my emotional language here, but I get really upset when I see that because that is not the model promised in the policy, nor is it a, 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 an element of discussion in the contract between policyholder and contractor, and yet we do it. And so I wonder what it's going to take to stop this poor practice because I don't know of any other industry on the planet where that is usual and customary. It is a really weird practice, a nuance of this industry. So when I see new people excited to get into our industry, there's a part of me that really relates to that. I love drawing out buildings. It is the funnest challenge ever. It is truly enjoyable. But it's that business side. Holy smokes, is it ever messed up? And we really need, our industry deserves to have that resolved in some fashion so that it's less adversarial and we can do our job, wake up in the morning and do our job with the smile that we all deserve to have. So so part of it, Ken, is is the terminology. And, and this is where, over the years, you see that the two industries have blended together, right? 
originally started in from the cleaning industry. Carpet cleaners moved in and started doing restoration. Construction companies would do the rebuilds on fires. And then you see this blending. So a carrier terminology is used a lot by contractors. We call them the insured. Well, they're customer. And so when we look at the two different terminologies, you kind of get understanding when you start blending. Oh, who's the insured? Everyone knows who we're talking about. Who's the customer? Sometimes we know we're talking about the insured. Sometimes it's the insurance company. Sometimes it's the adjuster. Uh, they have a policy. We have a contract. They have a reserve. We have a rough order of magnitude. And then they have policy limits. You have an estimate or an invoice. And this is what Ken's talking about, where that's the business side of dealing with the insurance company. When you start to look at as a restore your functionality, we're basically working with two major organizations. You're, you're working with the IICRC, our standards of how do we do the work, and then OSHA or oh and in other countries where uh, how are we performing the work safely? And those are your two primary uh, functions that are on there. Now, you also have the laws and jurisdictions that go with it. But when we start to look at drying documentation, are we doing the things that we need to do to protect our workers? And are we doing the things that we need to do to dry out the buildings? And are we documenting that properly? Are we documenting in such a way that we don't have biased documentation? And this is something that Ken and I were discussing. We've actually had this for probably now three years. We've had these talks about biased documentation versus unbiased documentation. So when you start to review contractors' reports or uh, we review other consultant reports, is it written in a way that is factual and unbiased or does it have a biased slant to it where they're selling uh, a position? And all of a sudden you look at your paperwork and that response is, are you selling a position or are you just reporting data back saying, based on this data, we made this decision? Or did you have a bias coming in that this is how we're going to dry? And what's interesting is in a lot of the disputes we end up in, there's a lot of bias in how a job is documented, both from the contractor side and the reviewer side. That leads to conflict because it's almost opinion-based. And opinion-based gets you into fights a lot more than facts. Facts the lawyers don't want to deal with, but the second you get into opinions, they can tear it apart. And so most of the disputes I see are biased documentation that have a lot of opinion without a lot of substance. Ken, you're seeing that same thing uh, in in the field work you're doing, right? Is it, like is that not true? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So and then what it comes down to is ethics and integrity. Is is it helping you do your job if you're following it? Um, the biased decision making uh, allow you to make money in the wrong way. And and one of the things that I've sort of been discussed or I've sort of been thinking about for the last few years is that bias position that the carriers have taken from a vendor pr process. And the bias position from a restorer trying to just keep the numbers in, in check so your business makes money. Those two uh, interests sometimes are conflicted. And what we look at is, can you drop claim severity and increase profitability? And it's something that you have to have intimate knowledge of the industry to be able to do. And right now, I don't think the players that are making the big decisions have that in-depth knowledge to be able to make a system that works. And so we see the broken system needs more review, more uh, accountability after the fact, less discussion before it happens. It's just, a, it's an interesting trend that we're in right now where a lot of you said it's harder to make money today than it was before, or it's hit and miss. I think that has to do with the system. It, it doesn't have to do with the people. We have more education now than we've ever had. We have more opportunities to get training than we've ever had. Uh, there's more online training, so so it's it's more accessible. Yet the industry seems to be harder to work in today than it did 10 years ago. And that's that's perplexing when you should be more knowledgeable, you have more information. So if I could speak to that, Chris, yeah. uh, one of the ways historically, and here I am being the historian after being in the industry for 47 years now, um, but going back to about the year 2000, when the Applied Structural Drying Course, ASD, uh, was evolving and being introduced to the market. That was one of the ways that our industry tried to provide greater value, lower loss severity, and more profit was through the creation of the ASD course 
and doing in-place drying or top-down drying, whichever expression you wish to use. This practice, for those that uh, of you in the, this call that may not be aware of what that means, it is when the contractor would leave the original installation of the building materials in place. You leave them unaltered. So baseboards remain on, the pad remains in place, the carpet remains in place. You put the equipment on top of the carpet. You do not remove any of these materials. And then you will dry everything in place from the top side. Now, the, the beauty behind that in the year 2000 was, look, we can dry everything and there's no rebuild, all right? Because everything is still in place and we get to use more equipment. And we all know that equipment is highly profitable. So this was the unique product offering of the in-place or top-down drying process, is that you could leave all the building materials in place, thus negate the rebuild costs, and you make more money with the drying equipment. So why didn't that survive? Why is that becoming less common than it was in the year 2000? And the reason why is because we have since learned that there are risks associated with leaving all the building components in place. That in fact, leaving wet carpet and pad on a plywood subfloor, there will be several days of that plywood continuing to absorb the moisture that's still present in the pad that is in contact with that plywood. And so it gets wet for the next three days, wetter for the next three days. Now, here's what's interesting. When I'm looking at these files that contractors are submitting and I'm watching, you know, looking at the drying records, I'm seeing drying records that do not reflect that truth, that the plywood is going to get wetter while the wet pad it remains in contact with the wood. There's no way it's going to be saturated on day one when you got there, the plywood. And that it's going to start drying within 12 or 24 hours. No, there's still wet pad in contact with it. It's going to get wetter before it gets better, especially in an in-place drying strategy. So what I'm finding when I read those records, I look at it and I just shake my head and go, these numbers are made up because that's not the way these buildings dry with an in-place drying strategy. And for those of you on the call who might be surprised by that message, I invite you to get your meter out and check it for yourself. Because after teaching the ASD class for many, many years, never once have I seen the plywood get drier when there is an in-place drying strategy with wet carpet and wet pad that you've extracted in contact with that plywood. The plywood gets wetter, not drier, after 24 hours. So this is one of the truths of this, and it's difficult to justify that to a reviewer who is looking at this and going, why didn't the material get drier? I don't want to pay you for that first 24 hours. Well, that's the physics of moisture movement. It's not that it immediately starts drying the minute you plug in a piece of machinery. So these... And, the other risk that happens is people started noticing that there are fancy colors appearing behind the baseboard after an in-place drying strategy because it, it dries so slowly. It's not uncommon. You're going to have a microbial condition that amplifies in an in-place drying strategy. So many contractors started to pull back from that attempt to dry everything in place without touching it because there are risks involved and it's difficult to explain why things got wetter for the next couple of days and then started to progress. And I will also say this, if there's anybody on the call that thinks an in place or top down ASD drying strategy dries buildings in three or four days, they need to go back to the same school that you learned your ASD and check to see if the house dries in three days. The course is four days. Tell me that building is dry after three days. It's not. And in fact, the flood houses that are out there, they did a survey, and I'm not gonna say who did it, but the average ASD flood house takes between eight and 11 days to actually meet dry standard. So if you're doing top-down drying and think that's a three or four day drying strategy, that is just false because the average drying time approaches two weeks for a top-down in-place drying strategy if you're checking the building competently and being intellectually honest with the process because it doesn't dry in three or four days. It just doesn't happen. 
And, and this comes into where we, we start talking about documentation that can be defended. So if you're documenting to make better drying decisions, you're actually recording the real data that's on site. And when you do that, you're effectively increasing your profits and reducing your liability. And to Ken's point, if the readings show that you're getting wetter and you have an explanation of why that's happening, a decision could be made. We don't want it to get wetter. Okay, well, then let's take out the pad. But you're you're actually using real data to have real conversations to then be able to support what you're doing. When you do that, you get some some really interesting things that come out. You have a legitimate conversation with the insurance carrier saying, this is what's happening. Here's what's going on on the job site, and here's the result. And the customer, you're validating that the work you did on the job site is the right work. It's when you get into the into this type of model of collecting real data that you're getting data-driven decisions and you're an honest broker, because like Ken said, we both have just recently have caught people submitting readings that don't make any sense. It's not physically possible to do what they said they did. And you have to have the questions. Like if you want to have that discussion, we can have that discussion. But what you said physically can't happen on a job. Then all of a sudden you get into the conflicted data, documentation that has a conflict. And it's usually documentation to get you paid. So I'm going to document and show that we did this great job. To Ken's point, I'm not going to show that things got wetter. I'm going to say that they got drier. Well, okay, what happens there? Well, you're following someone else's rules, even though it defies what's what's happening on the job site. And this is where you get some conflicts when you're a contractor on a preferred program and you, you go against a review of a, a second contractor or a homeowner and your data doesn't support it. If If Ken reviews it, and it doesn't add up, he can't tell you that you're in the good. So all of a sudden your data puts you as a bad actor. And when that happens, drawing problems don't get caught and the customer gets a substandard job. And to what Ken just said, you get those fancy colors underneath, a homeowner sees that and goes, I didn't have that before, or we've never had water damage, so why do I have those, those molds, those visible molds or vis visible microbial growth? Why do I have that after you're done? And it's because you're running with biased data. You're just trying to get paid and you're not an honest broker. And that's right now where most of the conflicts we're seeing are coming from is you've got contractors that are putting in really bad data and then selling it as if at the end of the job, it went the way that you said it was and, and you just can't substantiate it. So that biased documentation versus unbiased documentation is massive. And if you... You're going to see the trend right now. Um, I've got, well, we've got the Tramex remote monitoring system. So re you've got Phoenix with remote monitoring. You got all this independent data that's coming into the, into the marketplace. That is going to change the way we do, we do business because all of those readings can't be manipulated. Well, now you're going to start to see the trends where things get wetter and then they dry or you remove the materials in there, but now you're going to have that unbiased data that's starting to enter the marketplace. And so we're entering a new era. And for those of you that said, hey, things are getting harder, the rules got harder, the the, the systems are changing, the game is changing, but a lot of those, the way that we played the game 10 years ago doesn't necessarily work as good today. And I can tell you this is a trend that's happened. Ken's been in the industry 47 years. In 47 years, if he stayed still, he 47 years ago, he said this industry is easy to make money. If he stood still, 10 years later, it'd be harder to make money. 10 years later, it's harder to make money. If you enter the business at any one of those 10-year segments that Ken's been in the industry, you'll always say that the, the previous 10 years were harder to make money because you learned the rules then and the rules change over time. And so you get stuck in those ways. And that's why the new people entering now, they'll say that it's easier to make money today and it will be harder in 10 years. It's just how we all we all react. We get into a rut. And we don't change. We don't notice the industry changing around us. But when you enter it new, you figure out how to play with the environment that you're given. So we run into this source of loss versus cause of loss. Again, restore terminology versus carrier terminology. Uh, the source of loss is what we're going to run into. And I think it's important we talk about this because you'll hear a lot of contractors talk about cause of loss when really they should be talking about the source of loss. And when we look at source, source is a thing. It's a person, place, or thing by the definition. But when we look at it from a restoration perspective, we're looking at it's a ruptured water line. 
okay, is it a supply line or a waistline? Because that's that source is going to determine how we, we we handle the loss. Is it wind-driven rain, aquarium, a sump pump? What are we dealing with as our source, which results in our actions to, to deal with it? When we look at cause a loss, it's an action that caused a loss. So it's a person or a thing that gives rise to an action, a phenomenon or a condition. In the insurance world, it's a cut water line. It's a sump pump failure. It's a ruptured uh, pipe, frozen pipe. That's the cause. The, whether it's a frozen sewer line or water line, it's a frozen pipe that is defined in the policy. A leaking pipe is also defined in a policy, typically as an exclusion. For us, we would look at a leaking supply line and say, well, we're dealing with a, a source that's category one, or it's a clean, it's a sanitary supply line. And then now we're dealing with the resulting damage, uh, which could be a long-term water issue, and that's changed it. These terminologies we use interchangeably, but they're not. So cause of loss, you're talking an insurance policy term inside an insurance policy contract. Source of loss, we're talking about restoration. If you were to look at this picture, what possible sources of the loss could you have? You could have a potential tank. You could have the water from the bowl. You could have the water from the bowl with fecal matter, with urine. It's going to change how you handle it. You have uh, a leak from around the wax seal. You could have a supply line leak. There's all these different reasons you could have it. But your, your cause of loss could be a hammer fell into the toilet. Or your cause of loss could be the dog chewed a water line. Your source of the loss is the type of water we're dealing with. You have the same thing that happens here in a sink. And so what we start to look at is how is that restoration versus insurance uh, come together? And Ken, probably an important point is, is a perspective when you look at disputes is that terminology can get you into trouble. Um, we've spoken about restorers grabbing the wrong protocols. When they go to job sites, they're treating a category two as a category one. We're going to get into that um, where they start to get in there or they or the insurer takes control of the site and says, ah, the cause of loss is this, therefore you need to treat it like this. And I think that's probably one of the trends that we've started to see in the industry is the insurance companies now getting into the discussion around categorization or determining which side of the coin that this falls in. Are, are you seeing much of that now? Uh, yes, I am. Um, you know, this whole subject of cause of loss uh, as I understand, I, first of all, I'm not an insurance adjuster, nor am I an attorney. So I want everybody to know that. But the expression that I am familiar with from the insurance policy is called proximate causation, proximate causation. Now, what that means, that's the, the event that made it sudden and accidental and became a covered el an element of a covered peril. And so this whole subject of causation I have found to be a valuable understanding so that when there are disputes on a claim related to the causation of this damage, then this is a, a part of the discussion that would be relevant to an adjuster who is determining coverage decisions on an insurance claim. So while we are we we in this conversation, we're talking about the source of loss being the pipe. The causation is the fact that it froze and caused a rupture. This same line of reasoning can be taken to areas that end up going microbially amplified due to a delay that can be identified. Namely, in this discussion, a delay from an insurance carrier was so long that the building went moldy you document on day one that the job was not moldy. And then after the, the job progresses and there's delays that you've documented and it took an extra week, an extra two weeks, and now the job is all nasty, it's not uncommon that the, insurance, the insurer or the representative will say, ah, there's an exclusion for that microbial amplification. Here's the limit on the policy. If you can prove the causation is not um, from the uh, original event, but rather the causation is the result of the delays of the insurer, the conversation changes because now it's no longer subject to the, it, I gotta be careful, 
it might not be subject to the exclusion or limitation of the policy, but rather it's an error on the part of one party involved in that claim. And if you can trace that back to a certain entity, maybe they are responsible for the condition that the contractor must now deal with. So causation is an important bit of information in the file, especially if the, if the new damage is the result of delays. The causation is the delay, not the peril. And th that distinction might be valuable in discussions. The challenge for us is to document these conditions so that the discussion, if it should come up, is compellingly evident what caused it. Yeah, absolutely. And and you guys and you don't have to take that even if you come into a job and you're working with a with a carrier and you have a preferred contract and I did a lot of our work in Canada was was preferred programs. You're still documenting the job. It's just it's just it's not bias. It's we got to the job, there was no visible mold, here's my photos. Uh there was no visible growth. If you do any type of sampling, here's the sample results. It's just collecting data and it's not that you're doing it uh you know that things can go sideways but you're doing the data collection and then later on if someone needs the data you have it and it, you take the bias out of it and all of a sudden your data is you have a history of a process of collecting good unbiased data you're easy to deal with and you're easy to deal with in a dispute you're you you could be a witness for the carrier you could be a witness for the homeowner uh, or you're there to defend yourself. It doesn't really matter. Your data is impartial. And that's the biggest thing that I think we're getting here. We're at questions. Um, Kristen, I'll let you uh, take over. Perfect. Yeah, we've got a few uh, great questions coming in. So the first one is, if the loss occurred on September 1st with Cat 1, does this deteriorate into Cat 3 by Day 3 on September 4th? It depends. but. Oh, I can't answer it. Oh, really? Okay. All right. So first of all, let's acknowledge where the question comes from, because there was a period of time uh, when the IICRC S500 water damage standard uh, on page 88 in the 2006 version of the standard, there was a graphic that had three little images that showed the influence of time on category of water. And if you read the small language at the bottom of it, it said, yes, there it is. Thank you, Chris. Uh, you might remember those uh, that image. If you read the small print, it talks about the influence of time in changing category. And if you read that sentence carefully, it does say 72 hours that, that the category of water can change in as quickly as 72 hours, although it is not. this is being mentioned in the standard and it's not to be used as a threshold that defines the moment in which uh, you know, the water can change category. It's a laboratory test condition, and that's what they, you know, that's what was published in 2006. We've since had a 2015 version of the standard and now the 2021, and you will notice that that graphic is absent. They took it out. The person that made that realized it was flawed. It was flawed, and he didn't like the way the industry was using it, saying that after three days, the category of water changes, you know, as if on the 71st hour, it's still category one or two, and then on the 72nd hour, it changes to a three. That is ridiculous, and the laws of, you know, life and biology just don't work in such, you know, ways, um, and the, the main thing that they really noticed that they were wrong on is it's not about time, everyone. Time is not the big dis the, um, influence, it's not the greatest influence on water changing category. The biggest thing is temperature. The warmer it is, the more it, it behaves like an incubator. And that's what dictates the rate at which it changes category far more than the, the time that has gone by. It's not about time, it's about temperature. So if you're in Florida, I noticed in the comments that there's a lot of people from Sarasota. I live in Largo, a uh, clear water area. So I'm just right north of you. Um, and I'm telling you, it stays warm here for a dominant period of time throughout our, uh, our year. That is usually quite warm. And these jobs can change category 
not in days, but in hours, and in some case, minutes. That's how quickly bacteria can germinate and multiply. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to the categories. But this point is this three-day threshold. Please it, it, throw it, put it in your back pocket and just leave it as a historical reference be, because it's not accurate. And we don't have those thresholds published anywhere in our current standards. It was an idea that was published what, 10, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and it's now abandoned. So leave it in the past. It doesn't apply to our industry in today's market, not among competent restorers. We don't use that threshold. 72 hours. We don't use that. Chris? No, I'll just, I'll let that, that's good enough. I'll, I'll let Kristen go to the next one. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so the next question is when you have multiple drying chambers and you have a chamber dry before the others, how do you eliminate those tasks show up on the next day visit since the chamber material is dry and the equipment has been removed? Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll pull that one when we get up to drying chambers. Perfect. So um, going back to um, insurance. So the insurance tells us it has, it is the policyholder's responsibility to mitigate regardless of coverage. How do you get around that? Well, for both it, of it, us or Chris, go ahead. No, it, so so it is in in most policies, and there, I'm, I say most because I haven't seen one that doesn't have this, is that as the property owner, you have to mitigate against the damage. So that's take care of maintenance. And that's when a loss happens not to just stand there and watch is to take action. That's the expectation of the insurance carrier. It, it's, it comes in this responsibility. You couldn't ask somebody in New York of how they would deal with your water damage in Texas. If you're the one that's in the house and you know there's water, there's there's an onus on you to, to, to reduce the severity and not turn another tap on um, if there's a loss happening. So, when they start saying that you, it's on you to mitigate, it's effectively coming in and 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 saying that you have to take steps to reasonably reduce the severity and don't delay in reporting. Or if there's a contractor that you're working with, is to allow it to take place. But there's a financial cost that if you didn't have insurance, how would you prevent that microbial growth, or how would you prevent or repair that water damage? You're going to take action and communicate with the carrier. And there's a whole bunch of, it's not just that one clause, there's usually like three or four clauses in there uh, that you'll communicate with the carrier immediately, you'll you'll uh, take steps to to mitigate the damage. So it's, it's a matter of, of what the contractual um, agreement is and then how that relates to the action of the homeowner. The owner, homeowner has to take action. That's That's what it comes down to. There's some weird things in there, like the insurance company has the right to investigate. So do they have the right to investigate before you take action? And some of that kind of gets convoluted and can get disputed at times because it's based on the interpretation of contract language. I don't know if that answers that question exactly on point, but it, it is the customer's responsibility. So Chris, everything you said was pretty much what I was gonna say, but I was gonna frame it differently. So okay. the question was, the, pol the policy says that the homeowner must take action to keep the damages to a minimum. That's fine. The policy also says that the insurer must be given the right to inspect. Now, if you go in there and start changing the building up and you start cutting things out and saying, ah, I have to do it, and then we're gonna worry about um, uh, the claim later, I have seen the claims where the insurer shows up and says, you cut out all the sheetrock, you took all the carpet out, you did everything. We must have been given the right to inspect. So since you already did the work, we deny the claim. I have seen more than one claim denied because the contractor went in there and did the job before the insurer had the right to inspect. And now, granted, I'm in Florida. This is the worst market on the planet. I, I'm just saying, if it happens here, maybe this trend is coming to your state or country soon. I'm just saying this happens here. 
Claims are denied if you do the work before the insurance company has been given the right to inspect. So the contractor responds with this. They, they, they had the claim denied. They paid dearly for that experience. So now what they do is they notify the insurance company with the policyholder. They notify the, the insurance company. We have a, a covered peril. You've already said that this is a covered loss. We are now waiting for approval for the, the, these steps that as a contractor we recommend uh, need to be done in order to have a, uh, a satisfactory, usual, customary, necessary, standard restoration practice. And you use those terms in your communication. And you say that we are standing by waiting for you to to communicate back to us when the, the, the appointment's going to be that you're going to come to the job site and you're going to, uh, you know, investigate this loss like you'd stipulate is required in order for this to be a covered loss. We're asking you to tell us when you're coming or that you will respond to this email and waive your right to inspect so that we can proceed. Please let us know the answer to either question, please note that we are stabilizing the property. Our burn rate is $350 a day, and our current balance is $6,530 because we're waiting for you to respond. And you send that email every darn day with a read receipt or some kind of a tracking receipt so you can tell what they did with that email. Because I promise you, at least here in Florida, what they're going to do is when you say, hey, we sent you an email every day for three weeks and you didn't respond, they're going to say, we never got those emails. By golly, you've got to prove they received those emails. And then with that, then they sit back in their chair and they go, well, crap, now we got to do something. So um, it, it's, it's become, like I said, you really got to think ahead on what you anticipate the insurer might do because a failure to respond to these types of communications is really not uncommon. They will drag it out for many days, even weeks, even months with no response. And then they blame everybody else for the fact that the job went you know, sour, that it became $100,000 or whatever. But because they didn't communicate and you're waiting for some communication on them. Um, I know this sounds very negative, but I, it's a reality here in Florida. And so the only way to use to respond to them when they say you had to do something, well, we did. We followed the language in your policy. It said you had to be given the right to inspect. And when we invited you and you didn't show up or respond, that's not on us. That's what's required in your own policy. And so, so that's the language. That's the, the the angle that I would recommend the contractor take. Ken, Ken doesn't get involved in many jobs that go straight forward. He's usually involved in the conflicted ones. <laughs> That's true. That, no, it's true. And so if my message comes across as negative, please understand that this is my world. This is what I'm exposed to daily from contractors. And these are the types of experiences. And they're all very similar. These are the issues that contractors face commonly in the state yeah. of Florida. Well, and, 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 and part of it is, is you may in different areas we see this as well so you, you might have one adjuster who takes that position and so you're you're running up against uh you know someone who's misinterpreting the policy typically it's the if you communicate well but to ken's point maybe his region normally if you communicate with the adjuster and come up with a plan and document it you go forward with it and it's usually relatively quick in certain regions it's it's not so um but yeah i like the passion of ken so <laughs> Go, Krista, we'll do one more and then we'll we'll get moving. Sounds good. So last one for this section. We've been seeing more and more adjusters not paying the emergency service call as it's part of doing business. How do we how should we respond in order to get paid? So this is a depends. If you're in a program, then you probably have signed or your organization has signed program rules where they're not uh they're not accepting that. If you're not in a program, it's it's not for them to exclude that if that's part of your normal business operation. Um, service Minimum service charges or service callouts is about diverting resources. It's not about taking the call that you got the job. It's about diverting resources from other jobs. So there's a there's a cost component to that. Um, but it is it's it's part of your contract. If they don't pay, it's kind of like if you went to the dentist and 
the dentist said, hey, your insurance company doesn't cover this procedure, you're on the hook for it. Okay, well, that's the same thing that goes to the homeowner is your insurance company is not covering the emergency service call out, even though there's no exclusion in the policy for it. They've decided they're not covering it. You're going to have to pay that fee uh, out of pocket. That's, you know, and, and that may or may not go to cover their deductible. So it could get chewed up as part of the deductible is that that service call out fee is included as the thousand dollars that they're giving you. They paid for this service call out there. There, there's a, oh, I'm not going to get into it, but there's some nuances around it. But this isn't the right environment to to get in that discussion. But there's there's certain ways that a policy acts that your emergency service call out could get dropped into the deductible amount. It's the out of pocket expense that the homeowner faces. All right, we're good. Let's get in. This is we're going to enter Ken's specialty. You want to hear some passion? You're going to hear it. Uh, we're going to jump into the categorization of water, and uh, and in here, I'll tell you, this is probably one of the best discussions I've had with Ken over the last three years. Is um, Actually, it's been longer than that. It's been about eight years now um, that we've, we've, I've got behind Ken on this one. I, I, I battled him for a while. Maybe it's his seniority that, that allowed him to win, but it's, it's his approach on looking at this. And so I'm going to, I'm going to go through this and, uh, uh, and then get Ken's opinions on it because there's a lot of times when we have a lot of opinion being put forward into this. And Ken's got this quote that he uses, opinions are the lowest form of hu human knowledge for it requires no accountability, no understanding, but the highest form of, of knowledge is empathy, it, for it requires us to suspend our ego and live in another's world. It requires profound purpose, larger than uh, than the self kind of understanding from Bill Bull Bullard. And uh, here's what's interesting, Ken, put a little bit to that quote, because Categorization is probably one of the more contentious things that we deal with that directly impacts severity. Yeah, so I'm disappointed by the entire subject of water category. So really quickly, category of water is an IICRC-ism. They're the ones that came up with the expression of category of water. So it's not something that's found anywhere else in any other industry that I'm aware of. Um, so the question is now, if the IICRC came up with the three categories of water, uh, which we should all know what they are, one, two, and three, and, and what each one is, what are the thresholds by which each one is measured? And there is nothing published on such a subject. Now, the IICRC has given us clues that we can use in our determination of the degree of contamination of the water. But this is not being read carefully enough from the standard. And I know you're going to be getting into that in this section, which is good, Chris. We'll talk about some of the elements that the standard speaks of that we should be looking at when we are categorizing water. What I find the most disappointing is that at the end of the day, it boils down to the Generally speaking, the general practice, the common practice that we see among restorers is everybody takes a wild guess that we will, um, you know, say, oh, the water came from this source. It's been here for this long. Eh, I think it's a two. Eh, I think it's a three. I think it's a one. Whatever. Everybody just comes up and maybe they'll have a little discussion between them. What do you think we should make this? A two or a three or a one? What do you think? And there's a little bit of a consensus among the, the, the 20 year old technicians that are on the job site with no scientific background, no understanding of biology, no understanding of the risks that we are actually facing, no real consideration of the occupants of the building and what their uh, needs are, no real consideration of how the microorganism uh, uh, behaves in different environments and what microorganisms might be present that we should be uh, aware of. These types of understandings are largely just uh, it's let, let's just take a swing at this and we'll call it whatever. Well, I'm going to say right here and now, if you were a claims adjuster, wouldn't you take that subject and go, everybody's guessing and there is nothing that, that they've got that says it is compellingly this conclusion. And frankly, nothing in the standard of care 
has a greater influence on the actual scope of work that would be um, performed on the job. Nothing is will have a greater influence on the scope of work than the determination of water category. Because if it's a one, hey, dry everything. If it's a three, cut everything out. So this is a really, really big money decision. And we just casually call it whatever and think, you know, it'll be accepted. No, it's not. If you're an adjuster, you're going to argue that one because no matter what angle you chose, whether it be a one or a three, if it can be proven wrong, the entire scope of work that you did can be challenged that you did it wrong because there's no evidence one way or the other. And so this is a really discouraging position that we find ourselves in because we have a lack of data and a lack of thresholds on what makes it a one versus two versus three. So the standard breaks it down into a, a category one protocol and a category two, three protocol. A two and a three is handled the same way, everyone. Same thing. So we only have two protocols to choose from. Don't you think we should be able to distinguish between a category one and a non-category one loss? And that's where we're gonna go with our discussion this morning. After yeah, so, so we we've got we've got the poll question coming up. What percentage of your files being reviewed are subject to a category change in exchange for price concessions? Now the price concessions could be there, but it's it's what percentage of your files are being uh, subject to a category change? And so if we're getting into this, then this I, or maybe maybe let me better define it. It's that after the fact, we're saying, hey, this is a category one. You That shouldn't have been a category three. This should have been a category one. Look, it came from a supply line. And therefore, because it came from a supply line, uh, your determination on category three is wrong. And that's that's I think that's probably the most common uh, battle line that I see is that they use the source of the loss as the determining factor uh, that we get into. And so... Actually, the numbers are interesting. Uh, I don't change my rates. I, I don't change I've my... I've seen the opposite, Chris. I've seen somebody call it a Category 1, and the insurer said, that's clearly a Category 3. I don't want to pay you for your Category 1 approach. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I haven't come across those ones yet. You should have been cutting it out. What are you pay, making me pay to dry this material out for if it's you know not Category 1? And they argue, they have a difference of opinion. And why is their opinion any more or less relevant than my technicians? Everybody's guessing. It's a guessing game. Yeah, no, I, I here's the results. I don't change my rates, 21%. Um, we've got zero to 25%. 59% of you say very rarely is that the discussion, 25 to 50%. So it's not as prevalent, Ken, or it doesn't look as prevalent. 50 to 75% of the time, 2%, and 75 to 100% of the time is 3%. So most people are not getting into a categorization battle very often, um, I guess is the best way to, to put that one, which is interesting. And 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 here's the thing. when and This is probably the world Ken lives in or the world I see where a lot of these battles that start is based on these conversations. So when they do get escalated up, uh, a lot of the, the miscommunication happens in these, these files, which would make sense that a lot of you go about your business and go about your day with little or less friction, and you don't end up in those disputes. When, when you look at it from a, uh, a perspective of, of communication, Communication fixes the problems, and and it and it there's this opportunity to create this bait and switch opportunity where it happens on both sides. If you ordered a burger and fries and you thought you were getting this, but in reality you got that, you wouldn't be too impressed paying fifteen dollars for a very plain burger and very little amount of fries. And I use this analogy because it's a lot of what what we do. We expect that the insurance adjuster understands what your level of service is and that you're giving them the, the deluxe burger with all the fries and they're used to buying this other cheap burger with little fries. And you, you just make the assumption that all contractors are doing what you're doing. All contractors communicate like you're communicating or they, 
have the gear that you're putting in or the, to have the training that you have. We're all different. All of the restorers, like Ken restores a certain way, I restore a different way. We get to the same objective, but we might have different skills that get us there. We might have different perspectives that get us there, and we have a different way of approaching it. But when we deal with source, or, or sorry, categorization, we're getting into the, the communication at the beginning has to be very transparent and very unique, and it provides an opportunity for a discussion and an explanation because it is going to change the way that the job goes if we determine it's a category one or we determine it's not a category one. And these are the wow. ways that you can determine that. And these are, uh, Ken highlights this and, and he highlights it in his book and he highlights it in any discussions that you're with. These would be the six things that you could look at. Uh, five of them um, you can easily do on your own. What is the source of the loss? So if the source is immediately a contaminated source, you don't have to go any further than that. You're you're now stuck at the source as a category three source. You're at a category three. If you broke a sewage line, uh, you are not going any further. Is there visual debris that would that the water has come into contact with that would allow you to um, make a determination that this no longer is a category one? Actually, I'll turn it over. Ken, you're the master of this. You 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 take take them through this this journey. I'm still stuck on the burgers on the previous slide. I'm all hungry now. <laughs> well, we're coming and up it, to break soon. I know. Actually, what I really want everybody to know is that the burger on the left with all the big fries and the tomato and everything, that's an American burger. The burger on the right is your Canadian burger, just so you know. <laughs> okay. So the source of water, yeah, that seems to be what everybody looks at. And that is what they call the, the category of the water. If it came from a freshwater supply line, it's a category one loss. I got to tell you, the minute it hits surfaces in the building, it comes into contact with substances that might not be uh, sanitary. Uh, this is, we found to be especially true if there are pets in the home. We've all seen what our dog does when he drags its butt across the carpet in the living room. That's spreading E. coli and coliform bacteria in the structure, and whether you want to admit it or not, any testing results will reveal this, what we, we know to be true, that it will be there. So the source of the water is considered in the categorization of water, but it is not the determination of what the water is. And we have found this to be incredibly um, meaningful uh, with, uh, with, with our testing process, because we have found that even from a freshwater source, the quantity of jobs that where the water remains freshwater after coming into contact with flooring or shelving under a kitchen sink or uh, behind the toilet or down into the basement or whatever it might be that you've got, even though it's a freshwater source, make no mistake, it comes into contact with other biological organisms and in a liquid environment, those microorganisms have a party and that party is really aggressive. They, it doubles in, in population at a surprising rate. And we're gonna talk more about this later on today. And um, the meaning behind that means it, it establishes that we have hours or even minutes before it changes category, not days. And that's why I say, and I think you're going to hear this talked about early, later, is that the real unicorn in water damage restoration are category one losses. They are as rare as you could ever imagine. These are not category one losses because category one water can be measured. And so if it doesn't meet the criteria for being category one anymore, then it must be something else. And if it's something else, it's a non-category one loss and we must treat it as such. Oh, I'm sorry, and visual debris. I'm sorry, I got stuck on that one. Let's talk a little bit about the visual debris. If you've got junk in that water, take a picture of it. Show that there's silt in the water or some kind of a, a granular substance in that fluid. If there's toilet paper in that water, get a close up. Okay, get it, make that part of your documentation. It might be from a freshwater source, but it came into contact with other stuff. Document that. The temperature, um, 
I dot I go around with a laser thermometer and I will take photo uh, like laser thermometer readings of the variety of different surfaces that have become wet in that building to demonstrate that these weren't cold surfaces like you would find in your refrigerator of 35 Fahrenheit or three degrees Celsius. That's not what we're dealing with. We're dealing with uh, you know, temperatures that are more reflective of a living condition, like 70 Fahrenheit, 21 Celsius, and warmer. Okay, these are great incubation temperatures. Microorganisms love to uh, multiply when it's in root in temperatures that we find ourselves comfortable in. Um, the odors, the presence of fragrances, uh, things like the smell of a laundry basket or a wet dog or your son's bedroom or a pair of nasty socks, okay? These types of fragrances are indications that bacteria has uh, is present and viable and is digesting micro, uh, or organic material and producing those fragrances. That's what we are smelling. So that's a clue that there is a, a bacterial amplification if it smells like a men's locker room or whatever you want to try and uh, 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 correlate it with. I will say that if you encounter that on the job site, document what the fragrances reminded you of. You can't, there's no meter out there that says we got this fragrance present. You have, it's a very subjective measure. And so you would document what everybody is smelling. How would you describe the fragrance, Mrs. Jones? How would you describe the fragrance, Bill? You know, and get those expressions written down. And it would be even best if you got them to just put their signature on whatever it is you wrote down. That becomes similar to an affidavit that these individuals documented what they uh, smelled at that moment in time. That's a strong indication that the uh, bacterial amplification has transpired. Uh, time, yeah, I'll document the time since the date of loss uh, at, in passing, but I'm not really following the time. It's kind of just like, ah, oh, it's been there for several days. I bet you the bacteria has really had a lot of time in order to germinate and amplify. And then finally, testing. For goodness sake, perform some kind of testing, some data. Take this, this determination of category out of the realm of guessing and opinions. And for the love of God, get some data from some source. It's not the sole determination. You can't just require uh, or just depend only on testing. That's not sufficient. And there's uh, you, there are meters available to us uh, for adenosine triphosphate testing, ATP. And there are people that will give pushback on the use of that technology. I say let them push back. It's the best documentation we've got. At, available to us now. It's better and more conclusive than a laboratory test. That's going to get a whole bunch of comments in the chat. I'm telling you that, Will. The ATP instant height um, uh, testing that you can get in the field is going to be more conclusive than taking a sample, shipping it to a lab, having them do something in the, in the laboratory, Pull some tests that are, in some cases, subjective tests. They're looking for a color change on, a, on some testing process. That's subjective. It's not quantified. And it had to survive the transit process. So instant on the site is better and more sensitive than what you can get at a laboratory. And so I'm big on using ATP in conjunction with consideration of the other five elements included in this list. And I will I, I maintain that that is a, a far more compelling list of con, uh, data that will produce a conclusion that everybody can rely on if the subject of category should ever be debated in the future. Yeah, and and look, let's move forward, Ken. Let's talk about category versus category two versus category three. Um, we, we got a lot of questions that I know last year we, we went through and we started to talk about when you also run into the hazardous and regulated materials, uh, mold, asbestos, fireman's water or fire suppression systems that aren't necessarily really mentioned in the, uh, the S 500. And, and we got to this point where, uh, it led, it is funny because Ken and I got into this 
this discussion about you know what is the unicorn and and mine's based on on an opinion ken's based on facts so so i'm going to eat a little crow here when i show this but this is how we we looked at it and over time i've i've changed my perspective i i thought there was a lot more category three um than category two now i use the definition from the s uh 500 from the iicrc so um is it grossly contaminated and is there a health risk for severe illness i went well there's there's it can be and ken and i have argued this he's like well it's subjective how do you know and i don't know i just have imperial or uh, um evidence from being in the field where where we don't get sick especially when you watch everyone's not wearing their ppe that level of sickness and and severe health doesn't happen as often so then i would move the three over here and say but there's a lot of probably mild sickness or mild contamination pink eye and other things that you get when you aren't being careful on on the job site but the category one versus category three we both agree there's a hard line on it and i'm moving my, my category ones have moved from you know maybe 25 percent to 10 percent and ken's down to like two percent so he's pulling me down but I understand the philosophy. I understand the reasoning why, and and it makes more sense that we're getting into. Uh, how would I put this? After COVID, uh, I started to look at things as if you apply co uh, an antimicrobial to a COVID surface, so you clean and then apply an antimicrobial. We handled that. Whether you you know the sources of of information that came in are, are diluted with facts and unfacts, however you want to position that, but. What we do know is that as you apply that to surfaces, what if we applied that to some category ones that Ken has determined as a category two, and you're like, well, we can, we can do things to get them back to that sanitary condition, but they're not there now. And that's why I've shrunk my list down, is that there's still a two, but we can make them a category one. Okay, do we have to do as much destructive stuff? Well, you get into a slippery slope because now you're talking liability. And so I've had to move my line down because from a business perspective or protecting the business, that line has to be reduced. How you operate as a homeowner, you can do things that have more risk. You take on more risk, but there's also no one holding you uh, tethered for liability. And the, and the best analogy or the best example I can use is like asbestos. It's a regulated substance that you as a contractor have to deal with in a certain way. You as a homeowner can deal in a completely different way than that of a contractor. So the same thing applies to water is you as a homeowner can deal with a water release in your home in a different way. But as a contractor, there's a certain responsibility and liability you take on. And so I've moved my position much closer to Ken's. Ken, I'll, I'll let you take it from there uh, when we move to the, the next slide here. Okay. This is where... Oh, oh. Dude, I didn't know if you wanted me to speak at this. No, point. sorry, sorry. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this up. We had some discussion earlier this morning. We got up early to talk about this. Um, the cause of loss versus the categorization of loss is one of those areas where you guys aren't seeing it as much, which is good. It's 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 better that you're able to make the call because that's how the standard uh, has interpreted. And, and Ken pointed out why uh, that might be somewhat flawed if we have inexperienced people making that dis discussion, but. If you have a causal loss that's a, a ruptured supply line and it contacts fecal matter, it goes from a one to a three. We see a lot of adjusters or insurance companies taking that, that position that it's a category one and that's how you treat it, regardless of what it contacts. And that's not what the standard says. Right. If it sits unnoticed for a period of time and has the ability to amplify, it's a two or three, it doesn't matter. And we'll get into why it doesn't matter. If it sits, if the site has a high temperature, and Ken mentioned Florida, it's a two or three very quickly uh, at room temperature or higher. So if you have a few days of a delay, you could always already be past the point of being call, uh, considered a category one. And then if you smell that odor when you arrive at the site, you've already missed the opportunity for it to be a category one. That odor is an indicator. It's a two or three or somewhere on that spectrum. If you're using these rules, it doesn't it doesn't take a lot to then come back and determine, is it a category one or is it not? And I love the fact that Ken puts it that way because that's an easy way for all of us in the field to be able to identify what's a category one. 
We look at our source, we look at all the factors, and we rule it out as a category one. And the second you rule it out as a category one, it doesn't matter, it's a two or a three, and you're gonna treat it the same way. Now I know the estimating systems have lagged behind. Xactimate has category two cleaning versus category three. You know, it's 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 incorrect. So the part of it is is the information that the insurance companies receive through the estimating software, through their training, they may be getting the wrong message. And so that's why we have some of this this incompatible communication that happens. But when we start to look at what is category one versus category three, the only difference between the two and the three is can the drywall potentially be left and can the carpet potentially be thoroughly cleaned? Um, Ken, I'm going to let you talk to this. Um, this was the discussion we had. I didn't get a chance to put the the definition in from the book, but can you talk to the, the S500 and how it reads uh, about the cleaning and about the water being splashed on the drywall. Can I get you to go through that? Yeah, I can. So let's, I, I will get to that. Let's just very quickly review my position on what category one water is. This is the only category that is defined anywhere and it's defined by every major city. I would suggest on the planet that every major city has published thresholds on how much coliform bacteria can be found in um uh, in the city supply lines? And the answer is generally zero. You're not allowed to have any coliform bacteria in your city supply lines. How about E. coli? Again, zero. So if those are the published thresholds, and I find that the water that is in, in the house, uh, the puddle of water that's in the house, I pull a sample, and it's got uh, viable coliform bacteria and E. coli, then it is no longer qualified to be considered category one. Now, how does the city control the, you know, the proliferation of these microorganisms? They add chlorine to the water. All right, so they do that. And we know that there's a little bit of chlorine in there that keeps that uh, microorganism in check. Now, here's what, when I bring that up to a debater, a person who wants to debate the, uh, the what I'm saying, they say, yeah, but you're not going to drink that water off the floor. So you can take that idea and throw it out the window because we're not going to be drinking that water. You're going to suck it up and you're going to dry it. Well, then the next part of that question is, well, let's talk about what that same city, what the thresholds are for E. coli and coliform bacteria in public swimming pools. That's physical contact, not drinking. And the answer is, they have to add chlorine to the public swimming pools it, by a factor of 10x. There is 10 times more chlorine in public swimming pools than there are in the typical city supply line. Why? Because when you drink water with bacteria in it, it goes into an acidic environment in your stomach, which is very inhospitable to bacteria. So if there was any in there, it, and there's only a few, your body's immune system can handle that but not when you're swimming in it, not when you're in physical contact with it, because that liquid can get into your eyes, your ears, and all of your other orifices. And that is a direct into your metabolism, into your, your body. And that's why they add chlorine to swimming pools. Um, and uh, I would suggest that if you are an occupant of a house and you had contaminated carpet and your restorer cleaned or steam cleaned the carpet and sprayed their favorite juice and dried that carpet out and there was still some viable organisms present on that carpet and you had athlete's foot those are open sores on people's feet one in five people has athlete's foot if that happened that is directly related to this loss or re related to that peril and i i think that we we deserve to possess that understanding so that we can make wise determinations of water category. All that being said, there's a threshold for category one. It's the city, you're not supposed to have those microorganisms present. So if there's microorganisms present like that, then it's not category one water. It's either a two or a three, and I don't care which one it is. If somebody wants to argue, it's not a three, it's a two. I go, you win. It's a two. It's the same procedure. You have to have containment, PPE, take out all the materials that absorb that significant or gross contamination. 
and you're going to have to uh, isolate the area, contain, uh, turn up, isolate the HVAC system, have a health and safety plan. Twos and threes require that. And if ones are so rare, man, we should be doing this all the time on these jobs and opening up the cavities to reveal the contaminated area so you can decontaminate it and then begin the drying. We all know you're not supposed to put air movers on twos and threes, right? We all know that. No air movers on twos and threes, not until you verified it's back to a category one. And I would suggest, I saw one of the questions, Ken, how do we get, how do we handle the pushback from those who say, uh, we don't want to pay for five days of drying, six days, seven days, eight days. What I'm going to suggest is that several days of these category two and three losses, if that's the dominant one that we're really encountering, if we have categories twos and three losses, what we do on the mitigation process, 80% of the activities that we perform on twos and threes are just getting the job ready for the first day of drying. You're isolating the area with containment. You've got negative air. You've got humidity control. You've got the furniture removed from the affected area. You've deconstructed the structure to remove the materials that absorbed that two or three water. Carpet, pad, sheetrock, insulation. You're going to be taking all that out. All your guys are wearing PPE. You're doing all that work. Then you have to wash, wash that structure. Don't just spray a juice, read the label. It says it needs to be applied to a cleaned surface. You charge for that cleaning step because it's federal law. You shall comply with that, that EPA registered disinfectants label. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a first sentence on every one of those EPA registered disinfectants. It is a violation of federal law to use this product in a fashion that is inconsistent with the labeling. So if the label says it must be applied to a cleaned surface, then you must clean the surface. You include the label as part of your documentation, highlight that sentence and say, this is why I had to clean it because I'm federally I'm told by federal law, I shall adhere to the rules of that label. And then you apply the disinfectant and then you get it tested. Now, all of that is not drying, but you had an air filter on that job. You had a dehumidifier, no air movers. You're just controlling the humidity and the particulate due to the deconstruction. By the way, it's not dust. There are exclusions in the policy for dust. So you call it particulate or debris. That's what you are um, uh, actually managing. And you will notice that 80% of the mitigation costs are just getting it ready for drying. Now, when you're ready for drying, you've got open structure and you have a few air movers and your dehumidifiers, the air scrubber is no longer required. Get that thing out of there. I, and I apologize, I said air scrubber. It's not an air scrubber. It's a negative air machine. You put that in in a fashion that makes a negatively pressurized chamber. The standard has said that about four or five times. Don't put air scrubbers in there. That's a HEPA filter that's just sitting in the middle of the room. You must configure it so that it produces a negatively pressurized chamber. And the standard says you might have to add some dehumidification because you're pulling in the outdoor air when the room is under negative. And it says you're supposed to add a dehumidifier and you document that. And then um, uh, after all that's done, then you can begin the drying process. What I suggest this group do is that you will create two scopes of work. One is mitigation phase one, getting the job ready for drying. And you make an invoice for that phase. Okay, you got a separate scope and a separate uh, um, invoice just for the decontamination and getting it ready for drying. And that's not uncommon that it's two, three, four, five, six days just to get it ready. And then a separate scope and equipment list for the drying effort. Separate the mitigation out into two phases. And that way you can have 14 days of equipment use, but you're not all for drying. Get change the discussion by by separating the two efforts, the two phases of mitigation combined. That's all the activity for mitigation, but it all it wasn't all for drying now, was it? So on category two sheetrock, 
If you have category two water that comes into contact with sheetrock, you'll notice at the back of the S500, it says that it's generally restorable. If you read the legend on generally restorable materials, it says, if cleanable, if cleanable. Now, if the water soaked into the sheetrock, is it cleanable? The answer is no way. Therefore, it's not a candidate for restoration. On the other hand, if the category two water splashed on the surface, but didn't soak into the material, then go get a towel and wipe it off. That's why category two sheetrock is generally restorable. It's if it's a splash, but if it's soaked into the material, it is not a candidate for restoration. So when you're using your moisture meters on sheetrock and you've called it category two, you should be recommending its physical removal, not an attempt to dry it. The standard is clear on this. And I am one, one of those experts that will reveal it and say, that is not an element that is that should have been attempted for restoration. It should have been recommended for its replacement. And then let the discussion ensue on what they're going to do in order to find settlement, because there is no way that absorbed category two sheetrock, a significant degree of contamination, not insignificant, it's freaking significant. There I am, there's my emotion getting into it. It's significant. You got to get it out if it's in the building. Otherwise, the structure, the structure's mitigation is incomplete, incomplete, and you deviated from the standard. You better have some good reason, reason for it, documented in your file for why you left that significant contamination in the building. Because people like me are going to ask you, why did you deviate from the standard? Why didn't you recommend its replacement? When we start talking about drying chambers there's times when you're looking at, at a structure and you're trying to determine your drying strategy and you can have different things that'll happen inside that strategy you might have a small chamber that you put into a large part of a room you might use an entire room as a chamber or an entire floor whatever your your job site dictates to you as what you're going to need to do you're going to have to modify your drying chamber and we get into these where you might have certain rooms that you have to build a drying chamber. But what you have to realize is those chambers, when you put them in place, you're effectively controlling the environment. And I have this photo where uh, I was in an airport and it, it, oh, I got a bunch more from airports that I go to that you see the, the drying in progress. We're, we're looking at a small drying area. The, the, the posts represent the actual drying area. That should be polyed in. Behind me is 30 or 40,000 square feet of terminal that we're drying with that, that dehumidifier. The dehumidifier is doing nothing in this situation. This happens a lot inside normal residential jobs where we're processing all the air of the building. And when we're building a drying chamber, the goal is for us to apply our control over that, the wet and affected surfaces to create the environment for drying we're basically applying the pressure to it. That means you control how much air you want to process. You're controlling what rooms you're impacting and what surfaces are getting your attention. You have to be building drying chambers, uh, setting up your containment. And then to Ken's point before, if you're doing a category two, three, you need to then be controlling where the contaminated air is going. You can't just let it go into the un uncontrolled part of the building you're blocking out HVACs, you're blocking out uh, passageways, you're putting the environment under negative pressure. You're dictating how the air is gonna move. You're not allowing the building site to dictate. All right, let's get into partial drying chambers here. Okay. When we start to look at, this becomes a documentation uh, issue, but partial drying chambers, there's there was questions in there about how do you take readings and when one part of the chamber is dry, and now we have to distinguish. Are we talking multiple chambers or different rooms within the same chamber? And it becomes one of these things, if you've used hydro or you do paper log, it doesn't really matter. The more chambers you have, the more paperwork you're going to generate. And so the goal is, at least in, in, when, my perspective of the goal is that you're going to reduce the number of chambers. And there's certain things that are going to help you impact your decision on reducing those chambers. So if we were to look at the office and laundry room, if we were running a job and there's no natural uh, corridor between them because it opens up to the rec room, you would treat those as potentially two different chambers. And you would then 
have to look at, well, what does that mean if you were to make them two different chambers? It means you double your paperwork. So each chamber has to have an affected area uh, reading. You're going to be doing calculations for your sizing of your equipment. You're going to be monitoring it. And what happens is when we start to look at that, we go, well, why would you run multiple chambers? And there's probably four times that you would. One, you have different conditions. One chamber requires more heat, more vapor pressure, or a different drying system. That would be a reason why I would break those two rooms out. You have to process too much unaffected air. So that, that rec room, which we had a very small corridor, we have to process the entire rec room. It doesn't make sense to have our equipment set up to do that processing of that unaffected air. So therefore we're gonna run two individual chambers. Uh, you might have sensitive materials so that it kind of comes back to one, but you have sensitive materials and you're gonna do two different drying setups uh, or you're you're going to be focusing uh, your drying ability on some more sensitive uh, items that are inside that building. And finally, you have contaminated environment in one area, and the other chamber doesn't have, uh, isn't it affected with those contaminants. And so you might get in a situation where maybe one room is where the dog lives, and the other room, the dog's not allowed. Uh, in the room where there's a pet, and it touches that fecal matter that's on the carpet, you're going to say, hey, this is a category three and we're going to change it, uh, change the way we handle this specific area. The area where the dog is not allowed, we're going to handle that as a category one. And that would be pretty much your, your main reasons of why you're handling it. So when we start to look at it, if we were treating these as separate chambers, our option that we have to move this into one chamber is to simply put up a small containment. And if you put up a small containment barrier, you can now use that entire area and only take one set of readings. Now I would walk around with my thermal hygrometer and I would go and make sure that both rooms are, are equalizing. They should. Sometimes they're a little bit different, but not enough to warrant doing another set of documentation on there. Where you start to run into, when do you start to look at building a second containment is if you have a small area that's impacted away. Again, we have all this unaffected air and we need to process it uh, so we make the choice that we want to control the drying environment. So we would reduce our environment down to a small area, put our equipment in there, and we could reduce the amount of equipment we need. Plus, we're also increasing the amount of control or the amount of impact our equipment has on that area. Ken, do you see anything with that other than my simple explanation of when you would do it? Is there anything else that you would run into that you You've caught. I, I I agree with everything you said about uh, the distinction between rooms, especially if you can tie them together like that. That becomes a single chamber. And I would remind everybody that one of the most common failures I notice among residential restorative drying mitigation companies is a failure to isolate the HVAC system from your drying chamber. It's amazing how many people will leave the HVAC system fully functional as if. It's not even there and then put a dehumidifier in their chamber and not recognize that the HVAC system is going to take your dehumidified air and dilute it throughout the entire area that that HVAC system is servicing. The HVAC system can completely negate your drying strategy. And as part of my file review process, I'm looking. What did you do with the HVAC system in that room that you sectioned off with some uh, plastic walls and negative air machines, whatever. What did you do with that HVAC? And it's amazing yep. how few people or how many people are just forgetting about it and not recognizing what it can do to your drying strategy. And, and then you also run into the amount of paperwork. So one of the things that we, we saw when I was with Encircle is that a lot of the a lot of the readings that were being taken was from every room within the chamber. So they're taking an affected reading from the office and the laundry room, and you only need one reading, and then you just verify it with your with your meter that they're all the same, and only record it once. You don't need to record every room. That's right. If there's a room that's an outlier where the atmospheric conditions are different in that room, you might want to then adjust your 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 equipment so that that doesn't happen. Uh, you may want to document that, but effectively you should have very similar. Uh, psychometrics within your entire chamber so we only need one reading and then when you move to a different chamber take one affected reading but just sample it uh inspect it with your meter you don't need to record it if it's the same and Absolutely. that's where we saw a lot of paperwork get built up a lot of time on the file wasted looking at the wrong 
readings and then they fail to do the moisture content in the materials, which is critical that you have that. So, Right. So one of the questions I just saw is how do you isolate the HVAC system? I would encourage uh, if you don't know how to do that, you should go and get your AMRT course, Applied Microbial Remediation Technician. That's the mold class where they teach isolate um, containment really, really in, in depth. Uh, in short, you put plastic over the vents, but now that's going to throw your balance of your HVAC system out of whack in the house. And if you're in a really cold area where it freezes outside and you've got no HVAC service, do you think you could cause uh, those rooms to freeze? And if they froze, could pipes break as a result of your strategy? Yes. Does that mean you have to bring in portable heat? Then the answer is yes. The reverse is also true in Florida or any other hot, humid area. If you isolate the HVAC system, is the temperature going to get super hot and humid? Yes. So do you need to bring in portable cooling systems for that chamber? The answer is yes. And you document it with your uh, psychrometric readings in justifying the use of your portable heating or portable cooling systems. Sounds good. So first question is, if there is a cat one loss, but there is a microbial growth, does it change the cat from a one to a three? I, I've missed the beginning of that. What was that? No problem. If there was a cat one loss, but there is a microbial growth, does it change the cat from a one to a three? When you're saying microbial growth, let's be clear. Are we talking mold or bacteria? Answer both, answer both ways, Ken. Okay, all right. So mold, the answer is heck no. The presence of mold, even if the water comes into contact with it, has nothing to do with water category. It just doesn't. It has nothing to do with it. What changes is the condition of the loss, not category. You have condition one, two, three. Condition one is normal, fung normal mold ecology in a home. Uh, condition two is elevated settled spores. And condition three is active, visible mold growth. Um, but it does not affect category. In fact, the standard has a separate section on what to do if you encounter mold. You'll notice that it's kind of like that fourth category. It's not really a category. It just says hazardous materials and mold. When you have those types of conditions, you must do the remediation before you address the, uh, the uh, mitigation, the, um, uh, the drying, the... Uh, the, the removal of the contaminated water, but you got to get rid of the mold first. If it was a bacteria amplification, then yes, that is a factor in changing the water category. Is that the bacteria, bacteria thrive in fluid, mold does not. Mold survives in a humid atmosphere, but bacteria thrives in liquid water. So that's why we don't mix the two discussions up. Mold and bacteria are two different discussions. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, it looks like a lot of people were saying mold. So that I think that was the perfect answer. Yeah, mold does not change water category. It, it's it's not even to be, it's not an element of the discussion. And so with visual debris, um, best practices to justify CAT 3 when there is a lack of photo documentation due to homeowner cleaning up the evidence. So for example, fecal matter. Sure. Um, yes, of course, when you have debris that the fluid encounters, that's going to change its visible physical appearance because it doesn't come out of the sink looking like that, right? So that's not a, a, a condition that you would say, look at that muddy water. That sure is nice category one water. It it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. Um, so no, I, I wouldn't think that... Uh, uh, the pres presence of debris in the water should be ignored. I will also say that that is true of firemen's water. Now, we all know that the firemen that throw tens of thousands of gallons into the house, we've seen that water. It's full of char and all kinds of other junk in that water. It's not category one, is it? If it's not category one, then it must be something else. And and so the point is, if the homeowners cleaned up the visual debris, but they, they make mention that that's what was there before, your notes need to reflect that the reason you made the decision to go category two or three is because the homeowner indicated there was solids there or there was that they had removed, previously removed the visual contamination uh, or contaminants that were there. Just make a note of it 
and that's the reason why you based your decision and um your chronological notes whether they're digital or or manually taken will reflect why you made the decision you made it's really easy to defend you at that point right let's go one more and then let's get moving we're we're we got to catch up on some time here perfect so what really is the difference between a cat 2 and a cat 3 why isn't contaminated just considered contaminated and how much e coli is too much That's a great so, question. I would suggest that you give that feedback to the S500 committee so that they can consider uh, that nuance. Because believe me, the subject of water category has been a very heated discussion among within that committee for a long, long time. Uh, you know, we don't have thresholds. We don't know how to distinguish between a two and a three. It just is kind of like, ah, uh, we... There should theoretically be a, a, you know, a two and theoretically be a three. Somewhere there is some distinguishing line, but nobody knows what that line looks like. So why don't we just distinguish it between category one, fresh water, and non-category one, not fresh water. And uh, then we approach it that way because category one is defined. It is measured. There are thresholds where they say, if it doesn't meet this criteria, it's not worthy of being in the city supply line, fresh water. It's not category one. Yeah, and 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 part of the discussion when Ken's talking about like the pools and, and the level of chlorine in there and the E. coli levels there, when you look at swimming water, swimming water has usually an E. coli count of 400 or less before they close the beach down. So you can swim in there. It gets down to risk management. It, the the you're in a public beach in the outside there's no expectation you can control the environment there's no liability for swimming in the water you choose to enter that water when you're in a pool there's an expectation someone's monitoring it so they're controlling the environment that's why there's there's different standards for us what's the standard for the building when you have kids what's the standard when you have seniors what's the standards of a normal home there is no no written standards. So how do you determine a category one versus a two, three? And it's a great question. I, I lean more towards Ken these days than I than I do previously. And then the reason why is because there's a legal, there's a liability and there's a risk management that your business takes and you're responsible if it goes sideways. So you you would lean more towards making sure that you took care of those contaminants. I'm All right, let's get a lot of comments ahead. in the in the the the, the feed about uh, some perhaps new um, de definitions or new thresholds or a new way to approach the subject of water category. I'm excited about seeing these types of comments. These are the types of comments that need to be given to the S500 committee for consideration in changing or making the subject of water category something that is easier for the restorer to distinguish on and more conclusive on their, our jobs. I think that we're, we struggle with uh, uh, having some guidance on this subject, and yet it's such an important part of our mitigation strategies. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, so we, when we get into psychrometrics, there's a there's a way that you can look at it. If you, when you, it's really important that you look at the readings and you understand exactly what's happening inside the building, outside the building, and how those those pressures and the conditions are impacting your drying. Now, when we get into this section, it's it's justifying the additional time. You got to take your readings. You got to interpret readings. Uh, you need to set your drying goals. You need to make sure that the 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 the, the pressures are working for you. And and what happened is when we got into uh, looking at reference psychrometrics. If you look at old paperwork, and when we talk about you know how things change. I changed my perspective of reference readings to inside the building and outside the building. So it actually looks a little bit more like this, is that we've got reference readings for the exterior, and then we've got reference readings for the interior. And the unaffected area, you often see not documented very well or, or at all. Inside that building, you are responsible not only for the drying chamber, but for what happens to the rest of the building. So if your drying chamber, to Ken's point there, causes secondary damage or you allow the, a different part of the building to freeze or overheat or the humidity gets too high, that's on you. That, that's, a, that's a restores decision. 
that you need to be responsible for. And so I look at it this way is that the reference areas are the unaffected area. If we had an increase in moisture in the unaffected area, that could justify putting a dehumidifier to stabilize that condition uh, or that in that environment. You could you could justify putting an air conditioner in a hot unaffected part of the area so that you can allow occupants to, to work normally in that space or live normally in that space. That's how you need to start looking at the building. And because when we start looking at the pressures, you can have it where you can have moisture impacting from the outside and the unaffected area into your drying chamber. So you have to compensate for that additional um, moisture that's trying to get into your, your drying chamber. And that's why I like that detailed calculation when we get to it. Uh, when we start to look at the exterior, what happens if our drying chamber is sending moisture into the unaffected area and also towards the exterior? It might be driving moisture to our outside walls. And so you have to be aware that the moisture just doesn't, the water vapor doesn't just go to the dehumidifier. A lot of times we think it does, but uh, I've got tons of photos where the restorer was trying to dry in a basement and their vapor pressure wasn't high enough that the water was actually condensating on the cold surface in the wall, and then it led to a large mold job after. Those are common things that you're going to run into. So you're trying to understand where are all the forces applying to your, your job and where does the moisture want to go. Your dehumidifier isn't necessarily the exact place that your, your water vapor is going to go. It's going to leave to the other forces. I'm Can so I excited you said that, Chris, because I've heard all my career uh, these arguments that the water will go out the same way it went in. That's just not true. It's yeah. going to go from areas of high vapor pressure inside the material to areas of less vapor pressure in the route of least resistance. And usually that's the backside of the gypsum wallboard. It goes into the cavity. And if there's a cold surface anywhere inside that cavity, it's going to go there just like it would go inside your dehumidifier to a cold surface. And so what will happen is it'll go to the cold, uh, let's say, foundation wall or the exterior sheathing because it's cold outside the building. And your moisture meter says, look, my sheetrock is dry. And you think you did a great job when, in fact, all you did is you moved the water three and a half inches to the other side of the wall out of the, the range of detection from your moisture meter. You think you dried it, but you just put it on you know, three and a half inches away. And so after a while, that water will bounce back into the sheetrock after you've removed all your, your equipment and you thought you did a good job and the building's wet again. And so the question is, where did this come from? You know, and so this is where our understanding of how water leaves a material is an important understanding. It doesn't always go to the dehumidifier. It will go to areas of less vapor pressure, and that might be inside the wall cavity, and that can cause problems down the road. So when we, and when we look at it inside the app, it, it's, it's looking at vapor pressure. I'm going to pull up this. That unaffected area to your chamber, we can look at our, our vapor pressures. We can look that we have forces that are coming in, and the way we do it inside of Encircle, or the, the way the app is built, is that those vapor pressures are showing you the higher the number, the higher the pressure, and it's going to move to an area of low pressure. So if we are chamber is the area of lower vapor pressure, we have the outside trying to get moisture in, we have the unaffected trying to get that in, is that going to impact your drying? Well, the outside might. If the house is, is well sealed, it might have less effect. Uh, if it has a higher vapor pressure differential, you could have more effect. Uh, the unaffected area definitely has more ways to, to access your drying environment. So the opportunity is greater for that to be impacted, but it could also reverse. Your drying environment, if it's poorly set up, could be negatively impacting your unaffected area. And you've got to be aware of that. There are a lot of secondary damages that you'll see inside of a job, especially when it gets illegal. So it's like not your run of the mill jobs. It's the ones where people are uh, picked up on the problems and now they're looking at it. That's one of the areas you're like, hey, the unaffected area was, was wrong from the beginning and it got worse direct result of the restorer not paying attention to it. Vapor pressure differentials in materials is a major um, area of opportunity for a restorer to really understand how to dry. When we look at vapor pressures, if you remember the old psych charts, uh, psychometric charts from when you were 
going through your schools and maybe you're using them now. Uh, we had vapor pressure listed on the side and we zoom in on it. That's the vapor pressure. It's a constant. When we start to look at our environment, we look at what material do we have? So we have a material at 72 degrees and this is what Ken was talking about. He's taking the measurements of the materials. If we got a temperature of 72 degrees at 100% saturation, we can extrapolate. Now this isn't an exact science and and but we can extrapolate a vapor pressure within that material. And then we look at our drying environment and say, well, we have a 90 degree chamber and we got a vapor pressure of 0.2. The difference between those two on the vapor pressure scale is the vapor pressure differential that we're looking for. So 0.8 to 0.2, we have a differential of 0.6. And what we're looking at is that creating those vapor pressure differentials between the material and the drying environment. A lot of times, and can you, uh, I'll have you quickly talk about this, but a lot of times we're monitoring the the atmosphere without paying attention to anything that's going on in the material. You take a moisture reading, but you don't take the temperature. You don't have an idea of how effective you're making that drying environment. I'll turn it to you. Well, I could spend, well, I do typically. No, you, you're, not, you're not going to. You spend one minute on this one. I know, but I spend days on this because this is the true force of drying. This is the measure. Everybody sits there and thinks it's about grains per pound. Bull. That is that that is a misunderstanding. That is a misuse of GPP. It has nothing to do with drying forces or what the materials will eventually become uh, in moisture content. It is not a game of GPP. It's a game of vapor pressures. And this is the, the true metric that quantifies the force of drying that you created and none of us are, are, are documenting this amazing metric that says we started this drawing force off with a delta vapor pressure of 0.6 inches HG, and we ended the job with 0.4 inches HG. And throughout our drawing plan, this is our drawing force throughout the entire uh, process. And I don't know of a single restorer on the planet that reports the force of drying they created. Rather, they're just saying, look at the GPP. And there is nothing about this psychrometry that, it, that suggests that grains per pound is a qualifier of your drying forces. It doesn't work that way. Uh, the only legitimate use that I know of for GPP is a grain depression calculation from your dehumidifier to establish how much water, the rate at which your dehumidifier is removing moisture from the air. That's the only legitimate use I know for GPP. Every other attempt to use GPP in our discussions has is, is made on fluff that you can easily debate and defeat. Uh, GPP does not quantify your drying forces. It is the wrong measure. Your ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. Yeah. Um, just looking here, make a quick change. There we go. I, I would agree, Ken. Here's what we got is when we look at our vapor pressure, we got this pole here. Uh, if I double my drying force, will I cut my drying speed in half? And you've got these options in the poll is no, I don't believe doubling the force will impact speed. Yes, use the power of the force. It depends. Other factors can impact the drying speed. Or I don't know, but I'm learning. And and all those are fair, fair questions. In here, it's interesting because you get a lot of um, discussions about applying massive amounts of heat to a building. Uh, running desiccants, which is, you know, the insurance industry, because I, I think they have a lack of knowledge. They call it specialty equipment. They're just tools in their toolbox, but they've defined them as specialty tools that require special permissions to use them, which makes no sense. But that's the industry we're in right now. Uh, the polling questions are coming in. It looks like 11. No, I do not believe doubling the force will impact speed. Yes, use the power of the force. It depends. Other factors can impact the drying speed. And I don't know, but I'm learning was 18%. So 67% say it depends. Um, and we got three and 12% 12, 12 say no, three say yes. And uh, the majority says it depends. It's interesting. 
when when we look at the uh, at vapor pressure and, and the impact, um, let me give you an example here. We take our building and we put our drying conditions in here. So we look at our material conditions and inside our materials, ah, oh, geez. You know what, guys, I apologize. I don't have the vapor pressures on this, but I know that if we take our material conditions and we start monitoring what's happening with the, with the material conditions, what you should see is that the material will have a high vapor pressure. Our drying chamber is going to have a lower vapor pressure, but the lowest vapor pressure that is in the building is our dehumidifier exhaust. Why? It's taking the moisture outside the drying chamber. So our dehumidifiers are bringing the chamber air down. And the goal is to get that air really dry in the chamber. Your lowest, uh, your driest air should be coming out of your dehumidifier. And the goal is to try to get the chamber and the dehumidifier as close as possible. That's when you have a, a really uh, torque down drying environment. But you're looking at those building, those material conditions. And as Ken said, nobody's looking at the material conditions of what's the temperature and what's the moisture content of that, of that material. If you don't know that, what are you doing? You're literally just building a drying environment and taking a reading and walking away. And so you have to change your, your perspective of if you're focused on drying the material, no one cares if you dry the air. They care if you dry the material, but you have to dry the air to get the conditions to dry the materials. And that's what you're really focused on uh, when, you're, when you're working on a job. Now, what factors will impact your ability to dry? And this is what I think is really interesting. Uh, Ken, I'll, I'll, I'll just get you briefly touch on this point because this is a critical pathway that if you're not focused here, you're going to miss a bunch of it down the road of your drying project. Right. I just want to reemphasize something you said. We are hired to dry the building, not hired to dry the air. And with that in mind, all of this focus on the air is an incomplete consideration when we're, we're when we're evaluating our drying strategy. Remember, we, we need to inspire the water molecule to leave the material we are drying and becoming a gas. And um, I, it's very important that the um, uh, that we consider the condition of the material and the condition of the water molecule in there that we're trying to deliver energy to in order for it to change state from being bonded with the material we're drying and becoming a gas. We always look at the air, but that tells us nothing about that molecule in the material we're drying. And that is, that's the foundation of most restorers documentation failure is that there's all this focus on the air and then a little bit of focus on the machine and then very little information about the material you're drying. If we're lucky, we can get a meter reading off of that material. And yet that's the, the focus of our objective is to work on that material. And we're looking at the air. We are completely misguided. And I, I would encourage our education programs to be more attentive to the, the, the need of the, the, the industry being that we need to focus on the material far more than just the air. The air yep. is only half the equation. What happens with these materials? And when you look at them, it's consider the material permeability, the ability for the moisture or the water vapor to move through a material. And think of it as a destination where you have an actual area. So if you want to look at it like dry town, and we've used that example where you go from a certain distance. If you travel through a material that allows you to pull a lot of moisture through, you can get there very quickly. But if you're in a material that takes forever to dry, it's going to take you multiple hours to get the same amount of water vapor out of that material. And so when we look at drying, the type of material we're drying is going to impact our ability to get the job dry in a matter of time. And so there's jobs where you might have sat there and went, you know what? I used to get jobs done in three, four, five days, whatever the number is. And now on this job, this seems to take a lot longer. I wasn't anticipating this job being that hard to dry. And what you'll find is it usually has to do with one, how did you build your drying chamber? And if you did it the same way, then the other factor is your materials. And so when we look at the permeability, you've got uh, this, this phenomenon where the higher the perms, the faster the moisture will be removed from a material. And so that's more mo moisture coming 
or more water vapor coming out of the material. We start looking at what type of barriers do we have. So we have a vapor impermeable vapor barrier, less than 0.1 perms. That's poly, sheet metal, rubber membrane, foil face insulation. Very hard to move moisture through, almost impossible to move moisture through. Then we come into very, uh, vapor semi-impermeable vapor barriers, which is four coats of latex or more. And the more coats you have, the harder it gets. Consider this anything that's older than uh, buildings older than five or 10 years. Normally, after about five or 10 years, they get a recoat of paint. 20 years, you're almost guaranteed that you're running into this. But normally, five to 10 years, there's a sprucing up of the paint. After your first set of paint and you start adding the second coat, the third coat, the fourth coat. You got a building that's 50 years old. How many coats are on that uh, wall covering? Um, all of a sudden, you're walking into multiple different types of, of vapor barrier or different, um, a different degree of vapor barrier that gets really hard. Maybe it puts you back into the last category. Then as we start to look at, we got vapor semi-permeable vapor barrier. This is your new construction. Your newer homes have three coats or, or less of latex paint. You got foam board, asphalt uh, building paper, OSB, and, uh, and plywood. And so now all of a sudden you're looking at going, okay, well, if I got a layer of plywood, I can maybe dry a little bit faster. And then to Ken, what he was talking about before is you've got this other layer, which is the really easy stuff to dry. Vapor permeable vapor barriers. Unpainted drywall, the backside of a drywall board is easy to dry. So if it has a choice between eight layers of paint or paper, which, which side is the water vapor going to choose to go through? Well, some of it may try to get through this way, but most of the pull is going to go back into the paper. And that leads to your problems in some of these older homes. When you're creating the drying environment, you create the vapor pressure, and the water has no option but to go into the other cavity on the backside. I like the injected dry systems for that to be able to circulate the air on the side that's going to release the moisture the easiest. You got Tyvek, you got insulation. And to put it in perspective, uh, and Ken caught this on, on a presentation we had done a few years ago, and I, I love the, the perspective they caught on this. If you look at the speed limits, it looks like this vapor impermeable vapor barrier is like one mile per hour. Not fast, you're not going to get there. Semi impermeable is 10 times faster. Semi permeable is 10 times faster than that, or 100 times faster than the vapor, uh, the impermeable vapor barrier. And then you go vapor permeable, the, the drywall, the unpainted drywall, it's a thousand times faster than the poly. Put that in perspective and you go, oh, well, in this house, I was drying a 30 or 40 year old home with lots of paint that's on the wall. That's why it took me longer to dry. Oh, maybe that's why we should have opened up the wall cavities because there was all of these barriers in there. I was drying a rubber, uh, carpet pad. Oh, that might impact the way that we dry because it's now acting more as a as, a, as an impermeable vapor barrier. All of these are going to impact your drying situation. This is why drying is so hard is because there's a whole bunch of factors from the way you set up your job to the temperature of your materials to the type of materials to the permeability of the materials. Can you want to add something on this one? You're muted, which is the best time. That's the that's the way I like you. That's right. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> the only thing I would add to your excellent comments, uh, Chris, is that um, I'd invite everybody to envision if the job takes four days to dry with one dehumidifier, couldn't we dry it in an hour with 50 dehumidifiers? It doesn't work that way. That's one thing I want this group to know is that you can't just keep doubling up on the equipment and think you're going to get it done in minutes if you just, you know, exponentially increase the amount of equipment. And the other thing I'd invite everybody to pay attention to is the finish on the wall, everybody. You know, I know that we've been taught that a latex paint allows water vapor to go through it much easier than a gloss paint. And while that is true, I would invite you to consider if you've got multiple layers of paint, every layer provides some restriction to the passage of vapor through it. And so if you've got 10 layers of paint, the perm rating is not what the last layer is being 
latex paint that allows water to go through it freely. It's the combination of all those layers that will result in possibly an impermeable surface. And if we think that your dehumidifier is doing anything to the process, you're mistaken. It's a, it's just, it's physics. The water has to be able to go into the low vapor pressure atmosphere. And it must have uh, some, uh, no barrier or limited barrier in that transfer process. Then we get into dry standards and drying goals. And this is an area that um, can get really contentious in a legal perspective of what were you trying to do and was it justified? And one of the areas that we see is that you have to understand what a dry standard is. An approximate, a reasonable approximation of the moisture level or moisture content of a material prior to the water intrusion. And that's from the current S500. And when we look at this, dry standards, the best way to determine what you're trying to get to is to grab an unaffected material inside the same structure. That is by far your most accurate method. And the reason why is you've got heating and air conditioning systems uh, that can impact the moisture content of material. You've got normal living. Is there multiple people that take showers and lots of cooking that will impact the normal uh, dry standard, the normal condition of that material, which may be different than a single guy who microwaves his food every day? That's a totally different environment. So you have to, you can't apply it across. But if you, if you don't have access to that, and that's not possible, then you would go with your known geographical area, previous experience, or reference from similar structures. All of those are opinions. The only one that is actually fact-driven is the first one. So we get asked, or when we got asked a ton at Encircle, hey, can you put in just a regional dry standard? I would advise you not to use that because that one is an opinion not based on fact. that You may be completely off inside that structure. And so your goal is to grab the most accurate reading, which is the one from that, that environment. When we look at drying goals, this is very important that the restorer, not anyone else, the restorer should establish the drying goals that would be expected to return the structure, systems, and contents to an acceptable condition and inhibit microbial growth. And these two statements without any further context are normally taken out of context and said, hey, as long as there's no microbial growth, you're good. And that's inaccurate and that's wrong. There are other factors that we put in and other responsibilities of a restorer that has to be taken into consideration. When we start to look at our drying goals, there's a whole bunch of reasons why you might want to do it. Are we discussing the drying goals with an agreed scope? If the project has limitations or complexities, that may impact what you're able to do. Uh, what's the composition? What are the expected conditions after the restorative drying? So. If we're installing materials that are moisture sensitive, as the restorer, your job is to ensure that you create the building's conditions to accept those materials. You can't just leave it uh, to the, the next subtrade to figure out. You've got prevailing weather conditions, you've got building assembly limitations, and you've got the US uh, DA Forest Product uh, Laboratories uh, um, handbook, wood handbook. Now I'm gonna talk about that a little bit here because that came up in a dispute that I was in and it was misquoted. And I'm going to explain to you how that applies to our industry because you will see it come up as a discussion. Along with these uh, above considerations, where applicable, it is recommended the drying goal be within 10% of the dry standard. Now that's what the expectation of the restorer. And the reason why is, and Ken can correct me if I'm wrong, but the reason why we have that goal is that if you get within 10% of the dry standard, so if it's six, it becomes 6.6. .6. If it's seven, it's 7.7. 7. Or if it's 10, it's 11%. The reason why is that tolerance allows almost all materials to be installed in that building without any concern. And the goal is that you're not, you don't have time to wait for a building to acclimate naturally. You have to get it ready for a quick repair. Ken, is there anything that I missed on that as to why that 10% has been recommended? Uh, yeah, because if you go all the way to 10%, you're surely going to have overdried some areas. And that's the concern. You don't want to overdry things. You don't want to pay for overdrying things. So if you get down to within 10%, generally speaking, 
It's not going to change dimensionally as it goes all the way back to your, your target of, let's say, 10%. 11% uh, is close enough. It's not going to change significantly dimensionally. And I will say that, you know, th there's a a lot of energy from debaters when they say uh, we only you only need to dry to 16% or 15%, whatever the magic number is they come up with, because it won't support mold growth. That's an incomplete consideration of what our objectives are. We are not hired to produce a house that won't turn moldy as, a, as an objective. That's not what we're hired to do. We're hired to return the structure to a condition that it was prior to the covered peril. And if you stop at 15% and your dry standard is eight, you're 7% away from that. And if you've got wood products, as they dry from 15 down to eight, it's going to continue to shrink. So if you went in there and started painting all the trim work that was dried to 16%, thinking that's good enough, those boards are going to shrink and you're going to have a, a, a flaw in the painted material. And that's on the contractor because he dried it to a damp condition, not an acceptably dry condition. And that's the difference. And that's why I fully reject recommendations to stop your drying at 15 or 16%. That is not in the standard of care. That is not compliant with our contracts agreement. And it's not part of our objectives. It's just to create a condition that won't support mold growth. So if you guys are using Encircle, we built that in to the app. So you'll see that there's the moisture content. The moisture content in your dry standard, that's what your meter had, had pulled off the material. In this case, it's drywall. And then the dry standard variance is 10%. So we leave that as the default. And so it automatically puts you at your drying goal of 55 points in this case. That effectively is setting you up. Now, I had this case, and I put this in here because this got referenced, is that the Wood Forest Handbook, or the Wood Handbook, uh, Wood as an Engineering Material, um, that restoration projects should be following this because it was referred to in the standard as an area where you could refer to you could you could cite and and use as part of your guidance and it's true you could do that if you have new construction if your building is going to be vacant for a number of months and you know that the conditions are going to be there you might consider using that but as a general rule that does not apply to you as a restorer that applies to new construction and that's the the goals that they have when we look at restoration, we're following the standard, guys. So although there's other things that could influence your decision-making, the standard does apply to you, and that's what you're going to be held accountable to. So if you create a situation where secondary damage happens because you didn't dry to a proper uh, number, maybe 10%, but if you determined it was more, that's fine, but you're also the one controlling the environment. What you have to look at is these are the two conditions that would be there. In the handbook, it says new construction normally within five percentage points, not when we say 10 in restoration, we're talking 10% of our dry standard. There, they're talking a full five percentage points. So if wood is 8% is where you're trying to get to, you can install it at 13 and let it naturally acclimate over 30 or 60 days while the building's being buttoned down and then there's the mechanical processes that are being applied. It's got time. In restoration, the, the, the goal of insurance is to get you back as quick as possible. You don't have that time. So we follow the, the 500. And that, if you ever hear it referred to, that's the only consideration that you might be like, hey, this building's going to be vacant for a year. Okay, you could probably not horse down on your drying. You can get it into five because you know the parameters of the building would allow for that. But in the normal course of most restoration, very few jobs are going to follow that format. And so that's how I would look at it if I was if I was you. And your goal is to get it as close as normal, uh, get, the, get it as close to normal as possible uh, to the normal condition that's inside that building. That's your goal. And if you follow that, your projects are going to go really well. And now you're starting to combine that. You combine vapor pressure, material permeance to the, the dry angle. All of a sudden, you're starting to build a plan, aren't you? 
you know what you need to do to get your, your temperature and humidity set up. You know what you're dealing with on material and you know what your drying goal is. That sounds like a plan coming together. All right, we've got a short period of time for a few questions. Perfect. So what if you have multiple affected areas, but they're separated by walls and require separate chambers on the same laws? Uh, if they're separated by walls. It, so if you were talking like a hotel room, where the rooms, you get two separate rooms that have our separate chambers, and you the common hallway can't be used. Yeah, you just run them as two separate um, drying environments. It means more paperwork. So you'd have to talk to your customer, and this is just communication, guys. Like as a, I, as a as a former adjuster that wasn't an adjuster long enough to to be good at it, you you want to let the insurance company know, hey, there's this complexity on the job site that's going to result in more time for us to document the job because we are drying these two rooms separately. It would be easier if we could shut the hallway down, but we can't. So we're, we're, we're going to have to do a little bit more paperwork. That's just, that's just the way it is. Or let them participate in, let's close the hallway down and make people go a different direction. That's also an option um, where we put the dehumidifier in the hallway and we feed the air into both, both rooms. It, it, it just means you got more paperwork if I understood the correction or the, the question right. All right, guys. Questions around moisture mapping and moisture points. When you start to look at this, this is documenting the evidence in a visual context that allows you to understand what's happening on the job site. It's like a map, right? We call it moisture mapping, which gives you a, the ability to reference different positions within the building of how you're doing it. And when you look at your loss, it, it helps somebody who's never been on site. And, and years ago, we used to have adjusters come to site. They look at it, go, yeah, I get an idea for it. Now they sit in a room and they may have never been to a job site or don't have the experience of the previous adjuster. And so now what you're looking at is being able to provide a visual story of what happened. Why is the toy room in, impacted here? Uh, how come you're dealing with the kitchen? All of that could be told through a moisture map. Moisture maps may be drawn on, on a schematic. They might be done in a more rudimentary way. They could be even hand-bombed. And what you're doing is you're basically just trying to provide context. Now, the better technology has come along, the easier this is, the faster it is to create. So your, your quality of your file can go way up. And Circle, has, uh, and Circle Floor Plan, that allows you to do a large floor plan in six minutes so that you can get this information and put it into your, your moisture map. But regardless of how you do it, you're going to want to document your job site. Now, the old way we used to do it would just be put tape on the wall so that we know exactly where we are. Now, I still use this system because there's a combination of digital documentation and the real world. And in the real world, I want my technician to be able to walk around and see what moisture point one in this room is. Um, mm -hmm. because that's important for making sure that we're doing the readings in the same area. Now, it's a little different. If we're doing drywall here, we take our drywall reading. If I'm doing baseboard or sill plate, I'm taking it under that reading uh, or in that general uh, vicinity. If I'm going to do the, the subfloor, I come down off of one and I go do the subfloor. I only put these moisture points here and, and work my way through that moisture point through the different materials we're reading. There is the other way that you have where you could come in and you could put dots. And so different dot systems exist. You could use multicolor dot systems. I don't like multicolor because it gives a, a bad indication that this was wet and then this is like less wet. And then now you're, we're yellow and then green is good. I don't like the multicolor, but people do it because you can get them at Staples cheap. Uh, I like the blue stickers. If you put the blue sticker on, you can put in when you took your readings, um, you can get two inch blue stickers that you can put on and it just shows where you're taking your different readings. But uh, Ken and I would agree, a lot of your, your readings, it doesn't dry straight down. It'll dry in, in, in weird patterns at times. Uh, so what are we actually measuring? Are we actually taking a reading? Are you averaging it out? Are you showing us just the wettest reading till you get to the, do you only take the bottom and just show it's 100%, 100%, 100%, 40, zero? How are you taking your readings? And Ken, you want to comment on that? 
actually I, I don't have much good to say about that but yeah boy do i ever see a lot of that on the reports on day one it's 100 on a scale of 100 day two it's 90 day three it's 80 day four it's 70 and then day five 30 and then eight it, it, things don't dry that way it just doesn't work that way and it, it's very frustrating and discouraging to see because you know that those numbers are probably made up because material moisture doesn't move in the way that they described uh but what am i supposed to say call them a liar you know it, it's kind of one of those things that you, you 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 know that it's wrong you know it's uh fraudulent but to say it is not really a professional thing to do and in private i could question them but it's not going to change anything. I just, I don't like seeing fraudulent paperwork. It just really discourages me because I can't have an intelligent conversation with an individual with numbers that are, that have exposed their uh, insincerity. But now in, in all fairness, this comes back to the biased documentation to get paid versus being an honest broker. So the industry, both the care insurance industry has things like, hey, we want to see it a certain way. We want to see progress. And so you're interpreting your readings. Now, if you were to come in here and take your moisture point, you might say at 24 inches, it's this reading. And at six inches, it's this reading. And you would just be imagining two points within the same wall for the same material. You'd measure the top dot, the bottom dot. Oh, top dot's dry. So we showed we made progress. And then we're waiting for the bottom dot to dry. It, it's, it's not perfect. And there's no good ways. Like I've seen moisture readings where you say, it's it's a distance from the the floor and then you pick a point and you're saying we're measuring these different distances it's time how much time do you have how many moisture points are you doing on the wall there's a whole bunch of factors that the residential restoration environment has created from a business perspective of like well we only take one reading on one wall we average it out we put it in our documentation can't validate it but that's a a, a way we we operate then for someone reviewing your file after you 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 have no way of validating data, and then one of the other ways that we see data being collected is where they put in these uh, um, these cards, and so more in healthcare or some industrial applications where there's a third party reviewer that's on site. So it could be um, could be the infection control officer at a hospital. It could be uh, you know one of the the laboratory scientists that's reviewing it. They want to see what's happening in the wall. So you see these stickers. This is uncommon for residential, but more common in uh, in industrial and healthcare. And then what we look at is we're looking at how do you document those moisture uh, points and where are you taking those moisture points? And so as we start to look through this, we, we are documenting it in a room. And to Ken's point, well, what if it's four feet? Like, what if we're dry here, but four feet away, we're not? Well, do you start a new moisture point to indicate that, hey, we're dry in like eight spots, but we found a new one that's wet, so we redocument it. I like that that position now that digital is starting to come into play. When you find that all your points are dry, but you have one that's wet, you add a new one and indicate that it's the remaining area that's still hard to dry. So, yes, we made success in in eight of eight, but we still found an area that, that that's wet. They're not ideal. But it's it's a better way, and as paper moves to digital, as digital improves, you're going to see that I think this is going to become easier for the restorer, not harder, because the tools are going to be more adaptive to what you're doing in the field. All right, let's jump into this poll. What percentage of Cat two three jobs do you stabilize before drying the job? Uh, we don't stabilize jobs. That's a fair answer. No one knows if you put that in there, by the way. Uh, zero to twenty five percent. 25 to 50, 50 to 75, or 75 to 100 percent of your jobs that are cat two uh, are stabilized before you dry. And the results are coming in. I appreciate it, guys. I always appreciate your honesty when you guys do this. I know uh, I sometimes get emails after being like, I didn't want to give you the answer, but I did anyway. Really appreciate when you guys do this. It's uh, it makes the conversation uh, a little bit more real and enjoyable. I All right, love to have seen a poll on what you what people or what the audience believes the definition or the objective of stabilization is. I you're you're going to get a chance to, to, to explain what it is. <laughs> okay. All right. That's good. 
So so seven percent said we don't stabilize. Uh, zero to twenty five said that nineteen uh, percent of the sorry nineteen percent of respondents stabilize zero to twenty five. The majority. No, it's not even the majority. The majority of people aren't doing it 75 to 100% of the time. we got 41% doing it 75 to 100% of the time. Here's, well, I'll let Ken tell you what the answer is. Uh, what? On the, the, the 75 to 100? 41% of you stabilize on your losses. So that, that means that the, the rest of us are, are, at times, not doing it correctly. These well, jobs require stabilization more times than not, there's very few situations you would not stabilize a two or three. I agree. You should be doing it almost on, I, I can't hardly think of an example when you wouldn't have a stabilization strategy on a contaminated loss. And in fact, the standard even has a component in the blue pages that speaks of stabilizing category two, three losses. So if you're not stabilizing on those losses, you're you're skipping an element of standard practice. So, so here's the only time that I would I would say that you could skip stabilization and dry in a contaminated environment, and that would be in the, a case of like a fire, where you have a building that is contaminated, but you want to get it dry, and you want to remove the moisture from there. You could dry a fire contaminated building again, all, like it's one of these rare situations where you know that you're you're going to spread contaminants throughout the building, but that's not. A concern of yours because you have to do other work and so you're you're choosing to dry a contaminated building and then you'll deal with the contaminants honestly though your your gear is going to take a a major shit kicking so you're going to have to have gear dedicated to doing that and i don't know if i would do that right or you're going to be bringing in desiccant air and putting it in and, and firing out the other side i don't think i would do that to my gear that is one there's only been two jobs that i've seen where that would have been the path i would have chose because the fallout or the cost of not doing it was substantially higher, but I, you couldn't blame the restore for not making that decision because it's not taught in our industry. So to Ken's point, 75 to 100% of the time is the right answer. Now, creating conditions for stabilization and drying, the problem that we run into is that a lot of the adjusters see the same equipment on the job and don't understand the difference of it. A lot of restorers, aren't necessarily trained when you're going through your 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 lessons through the uh through your training you're not necessarily getting a very clear picture of how to apply this to a job site and so when we start looking at creating the conditions for stabilization versus drying we have to look at what is the objective of stabilization and the objective is to prevent secondary damages to unaffected materials you are not doing anything to the affected material if a material is wet and you need to stabilize to deal with other conditions. Uh, uh, you need to deal with some of the business stuff that, that's coming in. That you you are going to get uh, amplified microbial growth on the wet materials. Your goal is to keep it off the unaffected materials. So I broke this down, and, I, and and when we looked at this, I said, well, why would you why would you stabilize a job? Well, the insurer needs to make coverage decisions. Uh, the tenants are in the way. So those are things that you can't control that is a reason why you would limit the amount of cost. You're like, hey, you know, I'll sacrifice my equipment. I'll put it in, try to secure the job, but I can't do anything. You might have uh, where payment is in question. And so if you're not sure if you're going to get paid, I could throw a piece of equipment in to try to secure the job, but I need to find out who's paying. It needs cat two or three remediation. You have biohazards, hazardous or regulated materials you have to deal with in advance, or you need to mobilize resources. So in a CAT situation, there's nothing wrong with you stabilizing a job to reduce the severity in order for you to get resources. And you might have arrogant people that come back and say, well, you're a restorer, you should do it. Well, that's not the reality of our business. If you have to mobilize resources, um, you might have someone say, well, they shouldn't have taken the job if they didn't have the resources ready to go. We're in the business of restoration. Not everybody has resources. You take the job, you move your resources in place. That's the business. And so from a business decision, these are the reasons why you would consider stabilizing instead of going straight into drying. Now, a lot of people will go straight into drying on these situations. And that's what we saw in the survey. And so you don't want to be doing that. Now, what is the stabilization conditions? 
somewhere between 60 and 80 Fahrenheit, uh, relative humidity between 35 and 55. If you're in those conditions, you're just controlling the environment. You're you're not allowing. Now, Ken, you had said that is it, it that the relative humidity has gone up in in some cases, or are there or or would these be the the numbers you'd be using? So, um, thank you, Chris. I, here's what I would say about stabilization. You were correct when you said the objective of stabilization is to prevent secondary damage in unaffected materials. Has nothing to do with the materials that are wet has everything to do with everything else that is unaffected. Now, we do know that from our WRT IICRC courses that um, you never want to exceed a certain relative humidity for fear that you can start causing damage in unaffected materials. Now, historically, Chris, we used the IICRC had set 60% relative humidity is the maximum humidity you would ever want to have in your uh, structure at any given point. Now, recently, I'll just change, uh, I'll tell you what a recent change in the last two years from the IICRC is. They've changed that number from 60% relative humidity to 70%. Um, don't know why it came out of nowhere. It hit me as a surprise, but that's the new not to exceed threshold. Now, that is what the objective of stabilization is to prevent the atmosphere from exceeding the 60% or 70% relative humidity threshold that we were taught never to exceed because that can cause damage in unaffected materials. Now, if that's the objective, it has nothing to do with the dehumidifier formula that is in the standard. Has You never reference it for stabilization. Your stable, stabilization strategy is keep it temperate, something that people can live in, 60 to 80 Fahrenheit, because that's what normal looks like in most people's homes, and between 35 to 55% relative humidity, because that's what normal people live in, is 35 to 55%. But it is not an industrial drying condition. So when I see contractors saying, we executed a stabilization strategy and we got it down to 20 grains per pound, my head explodes. That's a drying strategy not a stabilization strategy. They are completely different. And you document in your paperwork what you're trying to achieve and maintain in order to keep the unaffected materials from becoming affected. Now, will the materials that are wet go nasty? The answer is, yup, sure will. But you're not addressing the nasty stuff that you're gonna be cutting out. It's all about protecting the unaffected materials. That is its sole objective and quit confusing the two, keep them separate, two completely separate discussions, separate objectives, and that way you can control the critics that want to challenge your stabilization or drying strategy and your use of equipment. So in here, if you guys want to look in the standard, there's humidity control and contaminated structures, controlling humidity and stabilization, initial humidity control category one, and then you'll find this in mitigation phase one and two. Now, What's, what's interesting here is that in stabilization, and Ken's touched on this before, you're not going to find air movers are part of your stabilization. And the reason why is we're not transferring energy to the wall materials. We There's an argument that you say maybe you don't even take a, a, a reading of the wet materials. I think you do. I think you take an initial reading to validate the materials were wet when you got there. What materials are wet? We're now stabilizing. I would expect that those wet materials are going to be sacrificed later on. And so I like that documentation. I know there's some guys that say when we're stabilizing, we don't do the inspection, but I, I, I think that's a flawed method of not inspecting the job site and documenting the current conditions. I we got a counter the... view. I got a counter view. The standard okay. says you're supposed to do daily documentation of the drying process. There is no such language on stabilization. Uh, I, so, so, so I say the initial. I, I think you and I are probably in the same the camp. Initial is good. You've got to be able to document that things were wet and what was wet. But you don't need to do daily documentation no. of the stabilization strategy. Be be because there's no expectation that those materials are going to dry. And so you're not trying to dry them. They're going to so be wet. You're they're going to they're wet. wet. And they're going to be. And, and now when we go to start drying, we're going to do another inspection at the drying phase. That's right. And we will now document what condition those materials are in. And then 
you'll remove the material. So you might be like, hey, drywall was at 100% wet for 24 inches and we cut it out. Okay, it's now been removed from the from the from your reading log, but you validated it was wet, you validated it was category three and you removed it. And so all of that tells a story that when you get into a legal process, a, a, a file review, a dispute resolution, or you're gonna go to trial, it's all non-biased data. It just says, this is what happened, here's what it was, and we removed it. And it's easy for guys like Ken and I to come and understand the interpretation of your data. Good. Drying objectives. A little bit different here. Uh, Ken knows a thing or two about drying objectives. When we get in here, we're creating the conditions to remove water molecules from affected materials to reach your desired goals. And, and you'll hear in here um, vapor pressure differential. And you're trying to drive the, that vapor pressure differential normally between 0.3 and 0.5, depending on, it's probably reverse it. You want to start with a higher vapor pressure differential to a lower one, so 0.5 to 0.3. But the, the reality is if you can get 0.6 or 0.7, uh, if your conditions allow for it, you're going to be putting that pressure or applying that vapor pressure to the materials. You kind of going to be in this range on on more cases than not, though. This this 0.5 to 0.3, you probably start 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and you'll end up at 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, something like that. But when you start looking and and speaking about vapor pressure differential between materials and the and the uh, drying chamber you're now starting to tell a story about what you're trying to do. You're not just placing equipment and walking away. You actually are saying, here's what the intended purpose is. And so your drying conditions have to be set up for, the, for that parameter. Now, we have drying uh, or equipment calculations. And this is something that you run into where the insurance industry, because it directly relates to a price, has latched onto certain parts of the standard and misinterpreted certain parts of the standard uh, intentionally or unintentionally over time. And what we see is that these calculations are, they apply a lot of the time. The air mover calculations are part of the standard. So they're inside the, the standard of care. They're not in the appendix. I, Ken will disagree that they belong there because there's reasons that you can um, validate or move around that this is a prescribed drying method that doesn't necessarily have any science behind it. But you get one per room, one for every 50 to 70 square feet of wet floor, one for every 100 to 150 square feet of wet wall over two feet in ceilings. If you have an obstruction, like a, 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 an island, you get one for that and you can determine it. Is it a long island? Maybe you need two air movers for that or, or a different type of obstruction. Every inset or offset over 18 inches, you get an air mover so that you can ensure the airflow is moving across it. Now, what's interesting is that that's part of the standard of care. And then it goes in and talks about water that is less than two feet away from the wall in another room. And we go back to Sort of an old formula that was back from the old uh, standards that says you get one air mover for every 14 feet of this uh, floor and, and uh, wall that are impacted. Now, the problem is, is that those are not considering what type of air movers you're using. You could be using a little mini air mover. Uh, you could, you could, Ken's got these little fans that you could have, the little handhelds. It doesn't say that you're moving high velocity, low velocity. So inside the standard, there's also discussion about what type of velocity you have and what type of constant or what, what type of velocity you're going to have when you have a constant rate um, phase and when you're in the falling rate phase. And those velocities are like this. Constant rate phase is 600 feet per minute and the falling rate phase is approximately 150. So we're going to start off with high airflow and then we're going to reduce it. Ken, you want to add anything to this? Yeah, very quickly. So just so everybody understands what we're speaking of when we speak of the constant rate drying phase and falling rate, when there's a puddle of water and you have airflow going over it and you've, it's in a, uh, a consistent environment, there's going to be a rate of water molecules leaving that puddle of water that is constant until the puddle of water is gone. It's going to be the same rate of water molecules leaving until it's all gone. Now, when you have water trapped in the material, the, as you probably have experienced, at the beginning of that drying effort, the rate of evaporation is quite quick. 
But as you get closer and closer to your dry standard, the rate of evaporation slows down. That's called the falling rate drying phase. So if there's liquid on the surface, you're in constant rate. If there's no liquid on the surface, you're in the falling rate drying phase. So that's what the difference is. Now, the standard does say, it speaks of the constant rate phase, you should have 600 feet per minute. That's about eight miles an hour. That's a significant wind, wind speed. It's about the, the velocity of air that comes out of your air mover when you're about a dozen feet away. That's about 10, 8 to 10 miles an hour. Now, right in front of the air mover, it's between 18 and 24 miles an hour. 12 feet away, about 8 to 10. The falling rate phase of being 150 feet per minute is about 2.2 miles an hour. That's the wind velocity. I've got a, a, a magazine or a book. You know, when you wave it in front of your face, you get a little bit of a breeze. That's about 2 miles an hour. So when you are trying to dry out sheetrock or plywood or plaster or concrete or hardwood or any other material that has water molecules inside it, you want no more than this little breeze. If you put more wind velocity, you can actually slow the drying process down because you're making a skin of dry material, trapping the moisture inside it, it's called case hardening. It's a real thing. And so what you do is you slow the rate of wind velocity down. That way this, there, you don't make that skin on the surface. It remains a little bit moist so that water can transfer through the material about two miles an hour. Now we have to change the way we think about the deployment of our air movers so that we select the right style of air mover that can accomplish the two, two and a half miles an hour wind velocity over all the surfaces that we would encounter in that chamber. Because if it's too fast, you can slow the process down. If you don't have enough, then the process goes even, um, it can also slow down. So you have to have just the right amount of velocity. How do you measure it? Chris had a picture of that anemometer. Anemometer is that uh, device that you see on that screen. And it reports, it records and measures wind velocity at the surface of the material you are drying. Photograph that and now you can prove to the debater that you had the correct wind velocity <laughs> for a competent drying of a falling rate drying mitigation. I love you called it the debater. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to say the person arguing. I, I had to come up with a better expression because I don't want them to be our enemy. They're just, they want to debate. So fine, let's debate. But we'll go to the debate with facts and evidence. They'll have their opinions. We got the evidence. Who will prevail? It'll be the one with the evidence. So so when we get into dehumidification, we're talking about, um, we're going to quote the, the standard here. When a closed or combination system is planned and mechanical dehumidification is not already in use, restorer should determine an initial dehumidification capacity to establish humidity control for the targeted condition of the drying plan. And so we're getting into this drying plan discussion. What's the plan that you're trying to do? Are you communicating what your plan is? And when we go forward a little bit further, dehumidification capacity may be modified at any point after setup based on psychrometric readings to achieve or maintain the targeted conditions uh, in the drying plan. And what a lot of people misunderstand, and this comes from an insurance carrier standpoint, is that when we look at the simple calculation versus the detailed, and when I was with Encircle, we were getting asked tons and tons of questions about why are you using the wrong calculation? Simple dehumidification calculation should be used. Why are you using detailed? It's the wrong one. It's not part of the standard of care. These calculations are only the examples, and I want to explain to you why we chose the detailed dehumidification calculation, because I like it for a starting point. So I'll explain the difference to you guys here. You have the two choices. You could take um, the length, width, height, and come up with cubic feet and divide it by the dehumidifier style and the class factor. So um, in here, we could say, you know what, we're going to go and take 50 by 20 uh, by 10 feet. So a 50 foot long, 20 wide, 10 high, 10,000 CFM. We're going to use an LGR and the class is four, so we're going to get our factor of 40. And that'll tell you that you get 250 pints. And what I did is I took the easiest, the class one, 
and the class four, and then I ran it through the different scenarios. Now, when you get into a detailed calculation, the reason I like this is that there's a bunch of things that get considered. You look at your cubic foot and you start off with a base pint, which is a base factor of 70. And you get a build out density. So based on how the, the building is set up, whether it's a doctor's office with lots of rooms or a warehouse, you're gonna be sitting with a different type of factor for build out density. We then looked at building construction. Are these materials easier to dry or harder to dry? We look at the class of water. What's the class impact on the amount of dehumidification we get? Is the HVAC helping or hurting us? Or is it not there? And for a lot of you, you're not measuring it. A lot of times when at Encircle, it was like, hey, we don't use HVAC. Can you take it out? Well, it's a factor in whether it's helping or hurting you. And you should be considering that it might be hurting you and you need to actually consider that for uh, your calculation. Then we look at the weather impact. Is it is the building tight, moderate or loose? So is it an older building, newer building? Uh, are doors being opened in it a lot? And is the outside environment favorable, neutral or unfavorable? And it gives you a multiplier. Now these multipliers go anywhere from, uh, if we put our 10,000 cubic foot environment in here, we basically get a multiplier factor of 1.2 to 0.6. And I'm going to nerd out on this because I think this is important for you guys to understand. Building construction, harder to dry materials, you get another one and a half. And we, as we go through this, the different factors, if we take the, the best to the worst, we basically are sitting here with a multiplier factor of six, 8.61. So 8.61 times the starting point or 0.48. That's a massive range. And to give you an idea of how big of a range this is, this is what you could end up with on the same project, depending on the factors that are in there. 69 pints or 1,231 pints. If you use the simple calculation and you only looked at the simple calculation, you would only end up in this range, 100 to 250. And so the reason why we use the detailed is because it gives you more accuracy for your starting point. Now, when we look at the starting point, if I have a detailed, and this is where my range is on my detailed calculation, I can get to the exact same starting point as my simple calculation if the factors allow me to get there. But if I use the simple calculation, I can't get to where the detailed calculation starts you. And I look at this only as a starting position to get you close. There's a lot of flaws in this, but, but I like this better than anything else I've seen. In here, when we start to look at what happens if you have a job, that the factors of the building, the weather, the materials, the type of building come in and say, hey, you know what? You need to start around 700 pints to get this, this figured out. If that's where you're starting or that's where your starting point could be, then I want to look at it as a simple calculation comparison and say, well, what would happen? Now, Ken and I, we debated this uh, earlier this morning because there's a little bit of a, a business side that I look at it from this perspective. So I'm going to have Ken clear up the technical side after. But from a business side, if I started with a simple calculation, I started behind the eight ball already. I needed to start at 700 pints. So I put my equipment in based on what the simple calculation said, and I'm behind. From a business standpoint, I'm behind for three days. From a technical standpoint, I was behind the minute I decided to use the simple calculation. But in here, I might after a few days, deal with the humidity and get myself in alignment. I'm gonna to start to be in the right spot at some point down the road, potentially. The problem is if you get paid for three days, if you're on a program, you lost money on your first three days by not sizing your job right. Never mind, you didn't do the right thing for the building. You're not even getting paid what you should have got paid in the first three days. If you're only paid for three days or four days of drying equipment without further justification, or you, you can't get it, you already got underpaid if you're doing this. So when we roll out the detailed calculation, what happens is your first 24 hours, you're supposed to manage the spike. And actually, I would suggest you, you manage the spike before you leave the job. If your goal is to be under 60% relative humidity, if your goal is to get the conditions between 70 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit and under 50% relative humidity, you have to do that before you walk off the site. You don't know if your equipment's going to overload the site with humidity or your dehumidifiers are working to remove it. So in your first 24 hours, you might not do that, but you should. 
the next 48, you've set the job up for success. You're doing technically the right thing for drying. You're right for 72 hours and you're right, you know, four, five, six days out. Now, here's the thing. From a business perspective, this will lead you to the most prop, uh, profitability in your business because you're getting paid for those three days where you've got the highest equipment inventory in the job. And then later on, you're adjusting your equipment. You're starting to reduce your the amount of equipment that's on the job site. So that's the little bit of a difference that Ken and I have. Whereas, and Ken, correct me if I'm wrong, but Ken's like, technically, you're screwed uh, when you use the simple calculation out of the gate. Well, I... <clears throat> Okay, actually, this this whole subject you explained that so well, Chris, and kudos on having a, a good component like this in your presentation. Here's my message to the students: first of all, it the dehumidifier formula is not a component of the standard of care. It's not in the blue pages. They even took it out of the white pages. It's not even in the in the guideline. That dehumidifier formula is so made up that they relegated it to an appendix because it's not an element of the standard of care to be followed. So don't let anybody shove it down your throat saying, this is how much equipment you were supposed to have. I will also remind everybody that there's not a single passage anywhere in the entire standard that says that the dehumidifier formula dries anything. It is not a drying plan. It is not a component of a drying plan. It is not, there's no claim that it dries anything. The purpose of the dehumidifier formula that is relegated to the appendix has one sole purpose, and that is to manage the spike in humidity that is anticipated to happen the minute you turn on the air movers and cause some evaporation. You don't want to go over 60%, and that's what that formula claims to accomplish. It's a friendly bit of recommendation so that you don't exceed 60% RH the minute you turn on the air movers. And once you've managed that anticipated spike in humidity, it is never to be looked at or spoken about again. Nothing. 70% if you wish to use that number. So you don't go over 70. Now, with that in mind, these people who want to argue, oh, you, you didn't have the right amount of dehumidification in there and they're referencing that formula, please remind them that that is not part of any drawing plan. And you are not supposed to stick to that formula throughout the drawing process, because it's not, it has no claim to dry anything. It's not to be used in that fashion. And that's hey, all guys, my message would be on that. He, he, here, here's what Ken's referring to. Appendix B is the example dehumidification formula. So in the standard, this is where you'll find it at the far end of the book. The following formulas are provided as examples. They are not represented as a component of the preceding standard, meaning they don't apply. As with any method for approximating minimum dehumidification capacity, verification of efficacy, and adjustment through the use of appropriate instruments will be necessary. After the initial installation, appropriate adjustments, increase, decrease, reposition, and dehumidification capacity should be made based on the psychrometric readings in order to achieve or maintain the targeted conditions set in the drying plan. And in hydro, if you guys are using hydro, we set it as a temperature range, a relative humidity range, and a dew point differential. That 70% RH, you will be screwed if you go to figure out how the dew point differential is. It will trigger condensation alerts on all your walls. I have not found very many environments that you need to be over 50. And when you get into colder environments, 50% relative humidity would be the lowest I would go because at night when the walls cool off in the cooler temperatures of the evening, when you're not there, you're getting very close to dew point differential or you're very close to creating dew point. And, and if you're in that, in in circle, so in in circle dew point differential is basically if you're inside there, you don't have the forces to create a good drying environment on that material. You're not you're not creating the forces to dry. So that dew point differential one prevents you from condensating, and two, it's an alert that you, your wall is not set up in a good condition. So that to the person that asked about the alerts, we set the alerts that you change whatever you want. If you said this environment needs 80, you put it at 80. If it's 90, great. If it's too hot, we trigger and we tell you it's too high. It's too low, the RH is too high, or it's too low. That's what those alerts are there for. So that's how you use it. 
and we use the alerts to keep you on track. We don't use the calculation. Once you set your gear, you're now in those drying tolerances. And Mike will go through that when you guys come here, if you come on October um, for, for the, the hydro walkthrough, but that's how it's being used. And that's just how it relates to the standard. Everything that you're doing is about creating a great drying environment and managing that great drying environment. None of it has to do with taking a calculation and disagreeing. So if you got a reviewer that says, you didn't follow this, cool. And that has nothing to do with your drying plan. That was a starting point and a starting point only. Here's what I'd love to everybody to see on that slide, if you don't mind. No. Just go back there, if you don't mind. I can. All right, everybody take a look at the last two lines on the bottom of that quote, the yellow lines. Uh, psychrometric readings in order to achieve or maintain the targeted conditions set in the what? A drying plan. Have you ever seen a single file with a written drying plan ever? I haven't seen it. And yet that expression drying plan appears a half dozen times in this current standard and nobody has ever seen one. I just think that's a real missing element in our industry. Uh, we talked about placing equipment and that the goal is to get our velocity set up right for our air movers. When we start looking for our reasons for placing dehumidifiers, it's vapor pressure differentials and controlling the temperature and relative humidity goals, and they're all connected. So we're creating the, the conditions for that. What we get into is these other things that the industry is deemed as specialty equipment. A lot of restorers don't have it in their inventory, but heaters. The reason you're placing your heaters is you want to reach a desired condition. So you want to increase the BTUs. You want to increase the drying energy inside of there, which is increasing the temperature. And you're trying to get it to that desired temperature, but you might also be controlling uh, the heat primary drying system if you're, if you're running uh, an open drying system where you have the fortunate uh, opportunity of using dry air and bringing it in, and that's the system you choose. We talk about air conditioners, and there's not a lot of manufacturers making these portable air conditioners. Phoenix used to make them. Uh, they don't now. I think Dryes had them at one point, but they're not really well used. But where would you put them? Well, you want to decrease BTUs. You want to decrease the temperature. And then what we're doing is we might place a, a, a portable air conditioner in an unaffected area so we can keep those uh, conditions in a normal environment. Uh, there's We had a job where we cooked an old lady out. Uh, she, her living environment was 85 degrees or 86 degrees. And she complained that it was too hot for her. When we took the measurements, yeah, it was too hot. It was dangerously too hot for her. Uh, she didn't have a system that could, her body couldn't handle the heat. We had to get her out of the building and, and we got her out immediately. But you run risks when you're not managing those unaffected areas. And we, our techs weren't managing it. They didn't even think about it. Now, if you want to decrease the desired temperature range, let's say you have a bunch of equipment and you're in Florida and your equipment's starting to get you too high, you want to decrease the temperature of your drying chamber. You would use an, a, a portable air conditioner to, to offset the BTUs being generated by your equipment. Hey, Chris, really quickly, yeah. I was involved as an expert just last year on a job that was, it was a small job. It was an apartment uh, where the, the apartment had two windows, no sliding door and no thermostat inside the apartment. It was a section eight housing and the whole building was kept at one temperature for the occupants. They had no control over the temperature. Contractor went in there, small little water damage loss, put in their equipment. The occupant was 63 years old, 300 pounds, had a heart condition and diabetes. And the job started on Wednesday and on Saturday, she was found deceased on her bed. The contractor was sued for wrongful death and it went on his insurance policy. And sure enough, the next of kin got money for the death of their mother uh, as a result. And it, the, on the coroner's report, it said uh, hyper, hyperthermia, not hypothermia, that's cold, hyperthermia. She died due to heat. And uh, that's, a, it, I felt bad for the contractor. You know, it could happen to any one of us. But this uh, subject of temperature, we need to pay attention to that because people can and do die from elevated temperature. Yeah, and that, that job we had, 
it was an overlook. We were busy and they just overlooked it and didn't even think twice. Uh, didn't do a proper risk assessment. Um, you know, we got we got shoddy on our paperwork. We tightened up our paperwork after. Yeah. It happens, but you have to be aware of it. And that's what, you know, coming to these sessions is let's let's just talk about it, make sure we're all aware. Uh, particle count, re, or sorry, reason for using air scrubbers. You're reducing the particulate in the air. There's a lot of argument about why you would have an air scrubber on a category one loss. So you don't need air scrubbers. Take your particle counter. Start taking a particle counter reading and, and, and identify what was the particle count when you got there? What is the particle count when you turned on your equipment? And how are you going to mitigate that count? I guarantee you're going to see a spike in the particle count. And your goal if you're doing your, your health and safety assessment is to get a safe environment for workers and occupants, 100% justified, but you need data. Having an opinion of I put four of these in because it needed it doesn't fly these days. I put four of them in to reduce the particle level from here to here, absolutely justifiable. Chris, I will say that contractors must take uh, humidity and temperature readings out of every LGR that they have on the job. And they need to do that to prove that the device was working. For those of us who are struggling getting the insurance company to pay for the use of your air filtration devices, saying it wasn't necessary, prove that it was with a laser particle counter. We do it as by practice with dehumidifiers. Let's start doing that with air filtration devices. And here's what I will tell everybody in this audience. If you think that your air filtration device is delivering the performance of HEPA, you might be blown away at how disappointed you're going to be when you use a laser particle counter and measure the quality of the air leaving your air filtration devices and checking to see if it actually does deliver HEPA rated performance. I think you might be very disappointed in what you see coming out of your machines. The point being, I think that we can validate payment for or the value of our air filtration devices on our losses by doing laser particle count readings, recording that, and using that in defense of our use of air filtration devices, just like we do with dehumidifiers. Absolutely. Yeah, this is this is something that we absolutely need to be focused on as an industry. But what happened is I, I got into this discussion, and it was probably about six years ago. Um, I was working on a couple of cases where, a couple of files, sorry where we had discussions about restorers not placing dehumidification equipment into uh, a project and the insurance carrier was trying to hold them liable. And it led to a lot of discussion about how, when do we not put our equipment into jobs and when do you decide not to? And the number one area that's not discussed a lot is the business decision that we, we're not obligated to restore anybody's property. We don't have to go in. Uh, now, that might change a little bit if you're on a preferred program, but even on a preferred program, your reaction to a specific job may prevent you from actually doing the work. But from this probably more applies to the independence that you make a business decision that you're not going to take the job. If you took all of an insurance company's work, you probably made the business decision that you're going to take some jobs that you lose money on. As an independent operator, not in a program, you are fully capable of making the decision whether you want to do the job. The other reason you might not place equipment is it might be a technical reason. There might be a missing roof on there. There might be something that's, that's holding you back. Someone could place a limitation onto you so that you, you're not able to perform in that capacity. And then there might be a health and safety issue of why you're not doing it. Now, if we were actually look at these reasons and you start to look at those categories, you could break it down and say, well, if coverage is not confirmed, then I'm making a business decision whether I choose to put stuff on the job, because if I don't think the client is going to pay, I'm not going to take the risk. And that's a fair decision. There's nothing in the standard that says you're obligated to help everybody and anybody who called you. The contract's not signed. Payment's not assured. That's a business decision. You are not obligated to help them. The insurance company may have an obligation to indemnify them. But that's not your, you, as Ken said, you're not tied into that that tripod uh, where you have to perform. They can call somebody else who's willing to take that risk. When you get into a regulated material being pre present, that's a health and safety concern. That's also a technical concern. So you may not put your equipment in for there. Contamination, health and safety and technical. 
lack of access. You might be placed on the limitation that someone will not give you access to the building. That's a good reason to not put your equipment in. Stabilizing, that's a technical reason. Is is There's a contaminant and technically you're not going to go in and perform a drying until you stabilize the environment. And then you have no chamber, no roofs, no windows. Uh, technically, you're going to be doing nothing. So that's a technical reason for us not to follow through. Uh, dehumidifier readings. Dehumidifiers are starting to get smarter and smarter. I have no idea how to read this, guys. I will be honest. I was trained by Americans. Uh, I Ken does it. He's a former Canadian. He knows how to convert it. 21 Celsius and 29 Celsius means nothing to me as a restore. I, uh, I learned the imperial system. I think it's for drying, it's easier uh, for my Canadian and Australian friends. Some of you may or may not use uh, metric. It's hard. I can't do it. But these pieces of equipment have their onboard reading. So it's, it's providing you some information that you can then start to use as part of your drying. One of the things I would focus on, though, when you're taking your readings is you're not just relying on their system to give you your reading. You use your independent meter to validate what the system is telling you. Their, their unit tells you it's one thing. You put your, your um, uh, thermal hygrometer, capture your own readings and record it. And one of the biggest things that you do when you're taking this is to make sure you record the hours on the dehumidifier. This is kind of like looking at like an odometer on a car, right? You're, almost all dehumidifiers today are going to have a total hours meter on the unit, and they're going to have like a triptometer of like the total hours for the job. If I'm you, I'm setting that, that triptometer on every job when we start and recording how long, how many hours it is between readings. You have, you get in these liability situations where the homeowners turn off the hottest piece of equipment. And when they turn off your dehumidifier, your air mover is loading moisture into the room or into the chamber. And if it's been, if the dehumidifier, uh, if the dehumidifier has been turned off, that water vapor is going uncontrolled into the environment and you're not having a mechanism to pull it out. If there's secondary damages, you need to document that your hour meter didn't line up between your inspection times. Ken, you got anything on that one? I, I, I know you've, you've, you've come across it. Yeah, so these dehumidifiers that are equipped with thermal hygrometers, um, here's what my problem or challenge is with that, is that each dehumidifier has, a, has uh, at least, or probably two thermal hygrometers inside them. Each of them has their own calibration. Each of them cannot be checked for calibration, although you can use on the modern dehumidifiers, you can use your thermal hygrometer and adjust the thermal hygrometer uh, on the uh, uh, dehumidifier to match the performance of your thermal hygrometer. I'm just not a big fan of it because I'll end up having multiple thermal hygrometers in a single chamber and they can be not, well, they're not, they're not calibrated to each other. And so um, what I do is I will definitely reference them on the, I take note of it. When I walk in and see the dehumidifiers, I look at the grain depression calculation and go like, ah, cool, that one's putting out 17 grain depression. Um, but I use my handheld Visala is the brand that I choose to use. V is in Victor, A-I, S is in Sam, A-L-A. -A. Visala is the gold standard by which uh, we, measure, we we compare our thermal hygrometers against each other. It really is the gold standard. So that's the thermal hygrometer I use, and that's what I rely on when I'm doing my testing. I do want to just quickly say that the, the six-channel laser particle counter for use in checking your uh, um, air filtration devices, the way I use that is you find out what's in the center of the room. That way you know what's going into the machine. You get your six-channel laser particle counts, and then you to compare it to what comes out of the filtered side of your uh, air filtration device. And technically, you're supposed to have 99.97% reduction in the particulate down to 0.3 microns. That is HEPA rating. What we find is that frequently, even though you're DOP tested, even if you're DOP tested, that machine gets bumped around as it gets placed on the job and bumped around as it goes back to the shop. And that filter moves. And the seal that binds the, the filter to the machine, is it, it goes out of whack. And stuff gets past it. 
So DOP testing might be good for that moment, but the minute you move it and torque the machine or twist it or anything, that seat between the filter and the machine can become compromised and your performance might not be what you expect it to be. I find laser particle counters to be incredibly compelling. And especially I use it because we are not a regulated industry like asbestos, where you must have DOP tested filtration performance on your air filtration devices. We don't need DOP in our industry. It's not regulated. Laser particle counters, in my uh, opinion, are sufficient to determine or to establish that the machine is filtering sufficiently. So, so we get we get into the uh, the five grains or less discussion, or we don't pay. And and Ken and I, over the years, have 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 run into this and and have come up with this. Now, I I think I blitz you through the math because I think it's important to understand exactly what we're talking about. Ken calls them grain counters, mm -hmm. and if you give a a piece of equipment that's you know, let's say this dehumidifier is running three hundred cfm and we're pulling up four grains and someone says at under five grains i'm not paying for it what are they saying and so what we're looking at is that for every every pound of dry air there's seven thousand grains and those grains weigh weigh really really minuscule amounts 64.79 milligrams now when we look at that out of that seven thousand we're only pulling four grains and so for someone to say well it's it's a small number uh, we don't need to worry about it. Well, what are they talking about? We're talking about four grains for every approximately 14 cubic feet of dry air. So we've got 14 cubic feet. Imagine 14 one cubic foot boxes stacked in front of you. We run it through the machine and we pull out four little grains of water. Doesn't seem like a lot. As we work through here and we get into it, we go, well, we took four grains per pound of dry air or four grains for every 14 CFM. Our machine processes 300 CFM. So uh, we're pulling four grains at 300 CFM, that's 86 grains per, per minute, 5,100 grains per hour, and 523 grains per, uh, per day. When you start to move that calculation from that little grain of four over to pints, it adds up. And every day we're pulling 16.95 pints of really hard to get moisture that's trapped inside the building materials or in the environment out of the air and into our, uh, our collection. That looks like this. That's a fair amount of water to be removing on a microscopic level. What happens if you ramp it up? Because if we're only looking at grains, then someone's forgot some very critical parts of the formula, which is, how many CFM are we moving? And so if all of a sudden we ramp that up to 10,000 CFM, now we're pulling out 563 pints out of the air every day. 563 pints doesn't look like this. It looks like this. So someone that comes in and says, well, that four grains isn't, isn't working. They don't know what they're talking about. Now there is times when, when, we, when we get into where you would consider maybe making an adjustment. And I'm going to bring up Ken's slide here, where Ken's take is, is from a reviewer standpoint or a consultant standpoint on, on, on the discussion. And here, Ken, I'll throw your points up, is the, at five grains or less, the dehumidifier is not providing value and we're not paying. Let me show you and what will happen, and you're responsible for what happens. And I'll document the limitation that you placed on me per the standard. And Ken also had these two other uh, quotes. If there's more than one dehumidifier and you're getting uh, five grains or less, you might consider removing the dehumidifier. Before we pull the dehumidifier, we're going to collect a mold sample and document all the conditions at the time that the equipment was pulled. Ken, can I get you to explain those two to us? Yeah, sure. So if you've got a room with three dehumidifiers in it, and uh, let's say one has got a four grain depression, the other one has seven grains, and the other one has 10 grains. I would remove the dehumidifier with the four grain depression because it is removing the least amount of moisture. And I'd leave the other two behind because they can keep up with the rate of evaporation. I'm quite confident. Um, the That's that's the, the logic I have with the five grain depression. But I do want to say this. 
if you've got a chamber with only one dehumidifier in it, and the dehumidifier is producing some really dry air, you're down to the, you know, let's say maybe, oh, I don't know, 30 grains per pound in the room. That's, you know, you're down to where the limits are for refrigerant technology. If you're down to about 30 grains per pound, you might only have one grain depression, which means that for every 14 cubic feet per, uh, of air that goes through that machine, about the size of a four drawer filing cabinet, for every 14 cubic feet that goes through your dehumidifier, it's hanging on to one seven thousandth of a pound of water. Holy smokes, that's not a lot of water, is it? That's about the equivalent of 1.3 drips of water. That's what one grain of, uh, uh, of water looks like, 1.3 drips from an eyedropper. That's not a lot of water. So you're gonna have a critic say, that's not removing much water. You didn't need to do that. Your job is now dry. The problem with that logic is if the materials are still wet and you took that dehumidifier out of the room that was only giving you one grain per pound depression, what's going to happen to the humidity in the room? Well, it's going to bounce back up to something elevated, something much more humid than what that dehumidifier produced, right? And if that happens, what happens to the rate of evaporation from the material that you are drying? Well, it slows down or possibly even stops. And that's the result of removing a dehumidifier before the materials are dry. We are not hired to dry air. We're hired to produce an industrial drying chamber. And when we do that, then we are doing our job. So when somebody stands in a way and says, You're, I don't want you to do it the right way. I want you to take that machine out because it's not putting water in a bucket. You argue back, but I'm using it in order to produce an industrial drying condition that will be compromised if you make me take it out and the materials will not dry as planned. And that's the argument back. Let's go to the, um, the last one there. We talk about collecting a mold sample at the time it's being pulled. This is that preemptive test. What I've seen contractors do is when they, when they are forced to take that machine out, they will then that day go in there and pull some air samples. Pull some air samples inside, out, whatever. Prove the microbial condition that it is of that day. You then take that cassette, that air cassette, put it in the Ziploc baggie with the name of the customer, and you take that baggie and throw it in the corner of the office. If there's ever, ever a complaint down the road, you got the samples that you can then send to the lab and say, analyze these. I got to prove that at the time I was forced to take the equipment out of my this job, we had no environmental condition, no fungal condition that we needed to be worried about. And now that they took the equipment out, now I've got a mold condition and I can produce prove that it wasn't my activities that caused it. And that's that's why you would pull that sample. And it ties into the, to the last section here, guys, which is inspecting or monitoring to, to completion. Um, the IICRC goes into this, and, and this is why Ken uses the term inspections instead of monitoring as his, his nomenclature is once the project has been controlled and the correction of, da of the damage has begun, the restorer should continue gathering information through ongoing inspections and monitoring. Monitoring process can include, but is not limited, recording temperature, relative humidity readings, and other calculated psychrometric values, checking the moisture levels and the moisture content materials, and updating the reports. Restore should record and monitor relevant moisture measurements daily, preferably at the same time until drying goals have been achieved and documented. And the first of these inspections to monitor and make adjustments should be performed no later than the day following the, initi the initiation of restorative drying. The frequency of subsequent monitoring should be daily until drying goals have been met, but may be adjusted by the agreed scope of work potential for secondary damage, job site accessibility, or by agreement between the material interested parties, such adjustments should be documented. This is key, guys. When when you start looking at the responsibility of the restorer, a lot of time programs will come in and say, well, we you you only inspect the beginning and, and the last day. And, and it's like, well, then how do we make adjustments? They're talking about when you're getting paid. They're not necessarily talking about how you need to do the job. It gets mixed in when we talk pricing and the delivery of the standard. They're not reading the standard to know what it is. For the most part, program rules and the standard don't generally jive across the line. There's misinterpretations 
that you see, and that can result in you picking up liability or the insurance company picking up liability, un, uh, unknown liability. They're not predicting that that's the liability they get. When we look at this, the information gathered during ongoing inspections and monitoring can lead the restorer to adjust the placement of equipment and modify the drying capacity. Where progress is not acceptable, the restorer should take corrective action. And when we start to look at this, when you produce a narrative report of the events that led up to your decisions, you basically are looking at section 10.9, which is telling you that your documentation should tell the story of your job. Now, you're being held to this standard, whether you're new, whether you've been doing this, whether you've got two courses under your belt, or you've taken the entire uh, course load and continue to, to update it, a carrier or a TPA telling you not to do something is not a defense. You will get slayed in court. You will get slayed in dispute resolution process if your answer is the adjuster told me or the TPA told me, and that's why I did it. You're the one that's responsible to follow the standard. It's your obligation to follow it. When you follow the standards, you also know how to follow a deviation in the standard, how to notify the homeowner or the property owner, and that the deviation you're going to do, what the potential side effect of that deviation is, and why you're doing it. Generally, just cost alone is not a good enough reason to deviate, but cost may factor in. So you may need to do something different to protect yourself or your business, and don't fake your data. All right, question and answer time, Kristen. Hopefully we wrapped that all up for you. You did. Thanks, Chris. You did it better than I would have done. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go through some of these questions. Um, is there a rule of thumb with temp uh, and humidity that you would say is the most likely to increase in cat faster? Or is it exponential by temperature where higher is technically better? I, I'm so sorry. Could you, I, I, there was a word that didn't sound right to me. Could you please repeat that question? It is an important one. It sounds like it's a good question. Yeah. So is there a rule of thumb with temp and humidity that you would say is the most likely to increase in cat faster? Or is it exponential by temperature where higher is better? Increase in cat faster. Is that what you said? In in cat. In cats. Oh, in catastrophes. Cats. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay, I got it now. Okay. Is there a temperature range that's ideal for catastrophe zones? Is that the question in short? Frozen. <laughs> yeah. So gosh, I don't know if there is any um ideal window for catastrophe uh drying chambers. Um I, I would suggest that you'd want to keep it temperate, you know, keep it between, you know, reasonable living conditions, 70 to 85 degrees maximum. That's where my head is, 70 to 85 for drying strategies. And then, of course, you're going to want to um, manage the humidity levels and the wind velocity. And, the, and, of course, your objective is to try and make sure that the materials remain warm. If you've got materials that are somehow becoming cold, that is your enemy. That is your enemy, is cold material. So if you live in a cold region of this planet and you've got wintertime work, man, I, would, I wouldn't go anywhere without that laser thermometer because I'd be checking the temperature of the materials. If you've got a structure that's not well insulated and it's cold outside, your sheetrock might be remaining cold and that will... Um, possess a low vapor pressure within it. So I don't care how dry you make the air, it's going to probably be similar to the vapor pressure in that cold material and drying doesn't happen. So cold materials is an enemy to all drying strategies. So you should be aware of that. Um, and, and start paying less attention to the temperatures of the air and start paying more attention to the temperatures of the materials. The only time the temperature of the air becomes a, a an element of focus is when I'm looking at the performance of my dehumidifiers. LGRs, they tend to lose performance when you start getting into really hot temperatures in the triple digits Fahrenheit. That's when they start to diminish in their performance. And when you start to approach digital uh, triple digits with a desiccant, that's when it starts to lose performance. 
It doesn't stop its performance in either case, but it starts to slow it down. And then of course, in really cold conditions, the challenge is if you've got cold conditions with a dehumidifier, your materials are probably cold. So if I can have hot materials and cold air, my gosh, I'm gonna be a drying god. Um, but it's very difficult to produce that condition. Just remember, it's the temperature of the materials and the dryness of the air. Stop focusing on just the air. Yeah, I misinterpreted uh, I thought it was, what would be the ideal uh, temperature to, to deal with a cat? And if it's all frozen, you've got a lot of time to work with it. But that's yeah. a Canadian deal. Yeah, it's gonna stay frozen until spring. <laughs> Keep it frozen. Yeah. Um, the next question, would there ever be an instance where you would not seal a heat vent into a Cat 1 dry chamber for supplemental heat? For instance, during a Michigan winter, returns were covered. Yeah, it, you, when you get into, so this is a problem in Canada that we see a lot of, and it's the same as Michigan. When you start doing a Category 1 and you start blocking vents because you're raising just particulate into the air, where's your supplemental heat because you're cutting off your heating vents so that's where when we look at the heaters and it's been deemed them a specialty equipment no it's a required piece of equipment for dealing with us isolating the hvac system is it's not specialty it's just a piece of gear um yeah you you need to add supplemental heat in those situations and when you get to category two three now you're you're running your chamber under negative pressure you're going to have to ramp up your heat of that environment as well if you're venting to the outside. So uh, it's a great question, but it, it, it's standard. It should be standard operating procedure that if you need to supplement heat in a cold environment, you have it available. What I love so much about these two questions is you're talking more about the strategy of drying and less about the brainless dehumidifier formula and air mover formula that we've been taught through some education programs. That is not an engineer. That is not an engineered drying plan, um, and I, I love the fact that you're starting to look that this audience is starting to look at the structure's needs more than just these arbitrary formulas that people blindly follow. We're starting to think about the needs of the structure, and I think that's a really important transition to finding competent restoration. Yeah, I agree. These questions coming in have been fantastic. Um, maybe we'll do one more since we are at time. Um, so this question, this individual does a lot of dry outs in Florida with mold already present. How would you deal with that in the state of Florida where you must have a mold inspection um, and testing done before you can remove the mold? The longer it sits wet, the more chances of mold spreading. Oh, man. Okay, yeah. So <laughs> oh, what do I say about Florida? They've got rules that you find that aren't really a applicable anywhere else on, on the planet, and it is difficult. So if you've got a, a structure in, let's say, South Florida that has been hit with some hurricanes in the last two years, and then encountered insurance carriers who almost as practice denied claims, thus putting it into a waiting game. Well, what do you think happens on these houses when they put get them put in, into a waiting game? They go moldy. So when they finally get it approved, it's a moldy nightmare and the insurance carrier says, ah, we got a $3,000 cap on mold. Here's your three grand. You now see how that as a consumer, your head would explode going, the mold is the result of the insurance company's delay. So here we are today with all of these structures of which there are thousands in Florida right now because they were denied for a variety of reasons and the homeowners have all these moldy houses going, what do we do now because we have to get it fixed? I got no good answer on where the money comes from. That's the short answer. Um, and so I, I don't have any advice for you other than be careful because even with, they say that, the, what are they? That's that line goes say the best intentions is a road leading to something disappointment or something like that. Um, the point <laughs> is that you might want to try and help them and be a nice guy. I'm speaking from experience. 
every time you try and do that for somebody that's got a problem, you become the crutch that has to pay for every problem related to that job from that day forward. And so you're just trying to help them. Come on, I'll do something, you know, for a discount or whatever. And then they get a health consequence. My son, Billy, has an eye infection. And I think it's because you of the mold work you did. And you say, yeah, but I did it for only 10% of what the, I should have charged. Yeah, but now you got to guarantee the work. Oh, for crying out loud. So I don't have a good answer for that scenario, but it is a plague in Florida right now. Tons of structures, uh, not restored, and money is promised from nowhere. And these consumers in Florida are, well, frankly, they're leaving the state. They're just, uh, they're giving the house back to the bank is what I'm hearing, and they're leaving the state, which means that there's these banks that have houses that they don't want, you know, know what to do with. So I'm kind of looking, trying to find these distressed sales, and I'll get them, fix it up, and flip them, you know? That's kind of where we are. What a crazy question, man. I'm sorry. That was a very local, regional condition that we're faced with here, and uh, that's not, that's not industry-wide. It's just a Floridian problem. I think that's why they asked it, Ken, just specifically yeah. for you. Yeah. Well, I hope to meet you all one day. If you're if you're in the Florida area, you know, you got my phone number, you got my email right there on the screen. Send me an email and we'll get in touch and we'll see how we can collaborate. So um I think since it's 404, um, if anyone does need to sign off, you're more than welcome to. We want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, Chris and Ken have graciously agreed to stay just a few minutes longer to answer a few more questions. So you're more than welcome to stay on with us as well. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Have a great day. Um, and uh, I guess we'll chat soon. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Yeah, thank you, guys. All right, Kristen, what do you got for us? Yeah. All right, let's get into the meat and potatoes here. So why do hammer probes register a higher moisture content than a protometer pin? And maybe I'm mispronouncing that. I apologize. All right, no, we need more clarity it. on that. Is that the, the hammer probe connected to the protimeter? You're saying that that will give you a different reading in the same holes that you would use the two pins. So you take the hammer probe out, put the pins in there, and you got two different readings? No. Let's assume that's what they're saying. Okay, if let's, that's the case, that seems that seems weird. Let's assume yeah. that's not what they're saying. <laughs> well, if that's what they're saying, it shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that shouldn't do that. So, um, because it's the same uh, circuit board and same connection inside the meter, so I would suggest there is something weird going on. So if, if you answer it that way, then then there may be a fault with the meter. If you put a hammer probe into the wood and you go deeper than the the pins, you may have less moisture at the surface than you do in the core of the wood. That is two different ways of answering, Ken. So oh, I, I would agree well, with the your answer, position. Chris. I know what's going on. So the two pins on the hammer probe have an insulated area on the sides of the shaft of the pins. Only the tips of the pins are exposed metal. So when you use the hammer probe going into the wood, you're only getting the reading from the center of the wood. Now, on your two pins on the outside of the meter, it does not have that insulation. So when you put the pins into the wood, it's going to find the, the, the connection that has got the least resist resistance. It's going to report a higher, typically a higher moisture content value than your hammer probe would be. It's because of the insulation on the side of the pins on the hammer probe and only the tips are exposed. I think that is the answer. That's what's going on. Next question. Um, would you, would the use of a thermal camera help with documenting the drying process and validating the progress? Hmm. I have a thought. You go, Chris. I like it. I like the visual. If you can use it, to help provide the visual, but not use it as the only means of, of walking the site. Absolutely. I think it, it, it provides context. The one problem with it or, or the one challenge that can be is that depending on your settings or your familiarity with it, you may have troubles properly showing the water. It, 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 if you don't use it properly, it will look dry. Or it will look, you won't see the thermal, um differences and so you start documenting it that's the only downside is that when you get 
further into the into the project, it may not be as accurate visually as your as your moisture meters are picking up. But as a as a general tool, I like it when you do commercial. I like walking the site and looking for areas uh, to potentially investigate with a moisture meter. Yeah, and that's how that technology should be used. Now, that being said, I want to remind everybody with our thermal imaging cameras, if you're using the thermal imaging cameras on a daily basis to observe visually the, the data that is being reported back with your thermal imaging camera, I want everybody to understand what I'm about to say. If the, what you are seeing with your thermal imaging camera is the result of evaporative cooling, that when there's an evaporating surface, the surface shall be cooler than the surrounding area. And that's what your thermal imaging camera shows. So I have gotten into some pretty intense discussions with people who want to argue, look at my thermal imaging camera, look at all the cold materials, this is horrible, your job is lousy. I'm going, no. I am seeing the effects of evaporative cooling. I am thrilled with these cold surfaces. It proves that I am evaporating water from that material. It is the best message of the day. I am just ecstatic that I got cold surfaces all over the place here because drying is happening. If everything was the same temperature, no evaporation is happening. No drying is happening. So remember, the cold surfaces are the clue that it's drying and you should be happy with that. Not that everything is the same temperature. And that's an important understanding with thermal imaging technology. Awesome, thanks, Ken. Um, so we did have a couple of questions come in about um, roof leak water and the categorization. Um, so if water passed through the building material, the insulation, the drywall, the framing, um, and it's sitting wet for more than 72 hours, what would we categorize that as? Welcome to our webinar today. We'll start over. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, so here's the deal. 72 hours is meaningless, okay? It is not a threshold that's published in the standard. We've abandoned it. It's not in any exam. It is gone. Stop thinking about 48 hours or 72 hours. I don't care. Get your focus off of time and start focusing on the temperature of materials. Start thinking like an incubator rather than a stopwatch, okay? And that is, that's the main point. The next thing I want you to say, I wanna say is this, there is another bizarre, I guess it's an idea that if the water flows through a building assembly, it instantly changes category. Th that is a ridiculous idea and it has no merit whatsoever. There is nothing about the passage of water through a building material that makes it magically change category. And so that it has nothing to do with the criteria with, that we use in competently establishing the category of water. Stop thinking about it going through building materials. It's silly. Hey, um, Ken, Ken yeah. I think that comes from, that, that comes from the, the, I think it, it comes from the camp of would you drink it? And that's that's not part of the definition of the standard, but that's the that's the social media version of is it drinkable water? Would you drink it? If you wouldn't drink it, then it's not category one. It's not the same as the source. And that's that's the wrong perspective of looking at it. It has nothing to do with its potability. It's not about being potable or not. It's about it be meeting the criteria of being category one, which is defined. And it, th that's what needs to be truly measured. Uh, as far as the other six criteria or five criteria that are listed in the standard, not one of those criteria has anything do with, to do with the subject of having passed through a building assembly. If it comes into contact with a known contaminant, then yes, that is the, the measure, but not because of the style or the, of the assembly in the building. It has nothing to do with the subject. So I think maybe we'll do one more question. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is a bit of a, a long one, so bear with me. So dew point differential is super useful, but we've had a lot of spe specific success with evaporative potential. Which 
which uses a calculation from the vapor pressure and the dew point. How would you recommend using vapor differential versus vapor pressure or dew point differential? And would you be willing to include an evaporative potential specific tracker in the moisture point reading section? Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming this is an encircle specific question. So um, we went with the dew point differential from a from the perspective of we could figure out the dew point of the environment and we could allow you to adjust it. So in in southern climates, maybe 10 degrees Fahrenheit is a is a satisfactory dew point differential. In colder climates, you might be 15 or 20 uh, because of the radical change that you could get in your temperature in the evening uh, or the temperature, the external temperature that can impact your in, interior. Um, other evaporation potential. So when you start getting into people's proprietary knowledge at Encircle, we didn't take a position of incorporating that unless someone, unless there was one momentum where a lot of people were using it, and two, uh, you know, we were approached. So in in this case, we didn't have anything else that we put into the system. That's sort of an Encircle position on on how we went about uh, designing the software. There would be nothing that would stop you from putting it in. Uh, and Circle could put it in if the demand was there or the model, uh, you know, there was there was the right turn on that we want to use this type of feature. It just at the time in Circle Hydro never got developed to that point. So that would be the reason why it's not there. I don't know if that would answer that specific question, but it's uh, it'd be the same as any of the other proprietary thoughts out there. I want to make a comment about this dew point differential. They use that expression. And just so the audience understands what we're talking about here, dew point differential is the material's proximity to the dew point temperature. So we right. know that if the sheetrock is colder than the dew point temperature of the air, the sheetrock's going to start condensing water. And so there's been certain individuals in our industry that have tried to say, look, the farther away your material temperatures are from the dew point temperature of the air, the better and more stronger your drying chamber is. I will tell you that we don't have time to, to prove this right now, but it's very easy to prove when you look at the drying chart, or sorry, the psychrometric chart, is that proximity to dew point has nothing to do with drying forces. All it is is a management of risk. And to be honest with you, that measure comes from a known industry. The, the industry is called the National Association of Corrosion Engineers. Uh, NACE is the name of the organization. And they have they use delta dew point or dew point differentials or proximity to dew point temperature a lot on the subject of flash rust or corrosion. If you've got a factory and you want uh, to prevent flash rust from forming on all the iron machines that are in the warehouse, then what you do, you, here's your objective, Stick, keep, make sure that the, the, the big machines, the temperature of the metal is more than 10 degrees Fahrenheit away from the dew point temperature of the air in which it sits. You wanna make sure that you're at least 10 degrees away from the, the temperature at which the metal will start to condense water. Flash rust will happen even though there's no condensation forming on the, surf on the surface of the machine. You just have to exceed, here's a magic number that they publish, 60% relative humidity. If your chamber is, is uh, uh, temperate, let's say 70 degrees, and uh, you've got 60% relative humidity, you're in the zone that can, that can produce flash rust just because the machine exists in a chamber that exceeds 60% RH, it'll start to rust. And uh, that's one of the measures that we use when we're doing industrial work. Yeah, and to Ken's point, our dew point differential, so there are some instructors that were teaching it. We weren't using it as a drying metric. We were using it as a limit, as a, a risk limitation or a risk management tool within Encircle that we knew that condensation, well, when you hit condensation, you're not drying we wanted to be further away from that condensation zone and when you, not using it to the Ken's point where the further away you get from dew point, the better your drying environment. It was that 
once you exceeded 15 degrees, you were back into what we considered a safer environment. And what we had found is that technicians were drying and they were really close to dew point on their surface temperatures, which meant that they were having really difficult projects getting getting those those materials dry. So we put it in as an alert that would allow you to make changes to the chamber. It would justify the changes to the chamber so that you could get the drying forces aligned. But it was a it was a risk management tool when we put it in. And I, we, unfortunately, I think when we when we did it, we called it dew point differential. And it was only after it was put in um, that that the realis realization was that some other instructors were teaching dew point differential as a drying metric. We didn't use it for that purpose. Good question, though. Yeah. That's great. Um, so I just I want to thank you, Chris and Ken, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge with us. Um, we really appreciate it. But we we wish you all well and and thank you so much again for joining us. Thanks for sticking around till the end, guys. It was a pleasure. Take care, everyone. <laughs>